No, you're fine. You do you. Actually, you do <laughs> me. You're still yeah. lying. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Welcome in. I'm going to wait till Rusty comes in and requests to join the live, and then we will get started. So, hello, everybody. Happy Tuesday. <clears throat> Apologize in advance. Bella's packing up live sale orders in the background. You might hear her chime in, or you might hear crunchy paper. Um, just another day in the basement. <laughs> I was going to say another day at the office, but it's like, let's be real. I live in the basement. Okay. Rusty, I saw that you're here. Do it. I think he can't figure out how to do it. I actually, I don't know how you would do it either. You sent a request. I didn't see it. Try again. Hold on. Oh, oh, here. Okay. I accepted. Give it a second. It's coming. I swear. Did it happen? Oh, there you go. Yay. Hello, dear. All right. I can hear you. I can see you. Fabulous. Yay. All right. No drums, though, right? You're not playing the drums. I mean, if you want me to, I will. <laughs> <laughs> One of my customers was like, I'm only joining if he plays the drums. I'm like, drums are forbidden. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> drums are forbidden. Maybe, maybe <laughs> no. at the end. Maybe at the end. We'll see. I'll sign off and let you have your way with that. <laughs> okay, so thank you so much for letting me host this q and I'm going to give everybody a few more minutes to join in. I have some questions for you, um, and then we will ask questions or accept questions as the live goes on. I think it'll be really fun. Bella's in the background <laughs> packing orders. I'm sorry. Is it really loud? <laughs> what? I can't hear you. <laughs> Bella, <laughs> you're like grandma in the theater with the crunchy candy paper. Uh, somebody's just sneezing in the back. It's okay. Really bad. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, welcome in everybody. Thank you for joining us. So Rusty, tell us about, okay, we're going to do a couple things. I want, I want to share with everybody too, full disclosure that you and I have only like, like scratched the tip of the iceberg of this conversation. Like we've had this conversation in passing kind of, um, you know, over the year or two that we've known each other. Um, but not really, has it only been a year in COVID times? That's like 20. I've known you for 40 lifetimes. <laughs> I mean, let's be real. So, <laughs> um, so in full disclosure, I want people to know that as I'm asking questions tonight, they're kind of, I'm asking them for me too, for my information. Um, some of them I'll probably ask for the first time just because we haven't had enough time to talk about them all. Is that okay? Yeah. Good. Of course. <laughs> okay. So, um, and I also want to kind of have a, um, preface this by saying too, that this is your perspective, Rusty, on your travels, your experience with certain minds in certain countries, and that it's limited to what you have seen and experienced. We're not talking on a great big scale of, you know, this, not everything that we say is the be all end all of what it means to ethically source minerals, if that's even possible, right? Yeah, of course. I mean, nobody really knows everything. I only have my limited experience and it's different everywhere in the world. And there are some generalizations about some things. And then there's some things that are very location specific. So, you know, can't know it all. Fabulous. So that being said, we'll go into it with curiosity, open mindedness, respect as we <laughs> as we sneeze in the background. <laughs> Bella, you might have to you might have to pause. Or just maybe like take it to the other side. Sorry, <laughs> poor Bella. Um, <laughs> uh, so we're we're gonna approach this conversation with open mindedness, respect, um, and just general kindness about the topic. Um, also knowing that we don't know everything, knowing that it's impossible to know everything, um, and that for the most part, people in our industry, our colleagues, at least. We can speak for you and I are doing the absolute best we can um, with what's important to us. So, Absolutely. yeah, um, cool. So now that we've established a baseline of integrity, which is so critically important. <laughs> Damn it, they put me in my box. <laughs> Just kidding. We'll see if you whip out any accents, we might have to have a conversation, Rusty. Oh like, no, <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> okay, okay, serious. Get, get serious, get serious. Okay, <clears throat> so. Um, for anybody who's watching, I'm going to start by asking questions, but please do pop in if you have follow-ups. 
I will probably have follow-ups, Rusty, as you start talking. And um, yeah, are you ready to be grilled? I think, am I? <laughs> I don't know, are you? Yeah, okay. let's do it. We're going to start with something easy, like warm you up and ease you into it. Um, Rusty of Throw and Stones, tell us why you're qualified to speak on this matter. And, or are you? <laughs> no, I'm not qualified. Um, no, yes, don't qual do it. <laughs> uh, qualifications. Um, we started our business 20 years ago traveling. We fell in love with rocks when we were in India and we got a pretty uh, interesting perspective right from the start of what it's like to buy and sell and or make materials uh, in country of origin in places that don't have a lot of opportunities. Uh, and after that, we uh, started traveling a lot. That was our first trip. And it was like, oh, we started getting into some business. It was like, we really like this. And I started sourcing online. And then I started thinking about other travels. And so the first big trip I took was with the Quartz Crystal, Todd Gouge. And we went to South Africa. We stayed there for a month. And we got to go to uh, mining sites in Namibia. And we went to the Spirit Quartz site. We went to a lot of dealers. And so got to sort of understand both the markets and also the, the places that the material comes out of the ground and then the people who are running around in those areas that are sort of collecting and there's a, a bunch of different pieces of information that all come from all three of those things um i guess without taking up a million hours of time on that like fast forward we only four questions that i officially have for you so you're fine <laughs> oh okay well, i'm I'll relying on then. people to step up and be like there you go. We've already got some questions. How does one plan a trip like that? Yeah. Um, well, I, do I answer that now or do I go forward? Um, yeah. so, Come back. Okay. So um, we'll get to the how do we plan a trip like that. Um, so, I, you know, after the first trip, then it sort of solidified having international connections where it's like, you know, I, I really feel in a lot of ways like having a meal with someone and having a handshake with someone and, under, and establishing a firm basis in person is... Uh, not imperative, but it's a really critical part of understanding this industry and understanding trust because most of this industry is entirely based on trust. Yeah. And it's about, do you trust what they're saying that it came out of the ground this way? Do you trust that they're saying that this is going on and that's going on? And obviously you can't be everywhere all at once. Even if you move to Africa, if you're trying to do business in other places, you know, like you have to know what's going on on the ground there. So having uh, the experience of going there and meeting the people and sharing meals and traveling and bobbing your head up and down in their car for however many hours in some crazy ass road and like having those personal experiences, you can draw from that trust to gain information. And, um, so I guess fast forward, we took lots and lots of trips after we started traveling. I mean, I started going between three and five trips every year, uh, a lot to them. At first it was more to the mining areas and to the markets. And then it was more. And Rusty, where were you going? Which country specifically? Uh, first, uh, India was first and then South Africa was shortly after that. And then we started doing a lot of the mineral shows. Like we started running the circuit around the country, around the United States, doing Denver and Tucson and Springfield and a lot of the smaller shows. So like that got, uh, gave us a little bit more of a history because Tucson in general has been going on for over 70 years and all of the minerals from all over the world all come to Tucson. So like the amount of not just sheer material, but the amount of information mm -hmm. that exists in the, 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 just the ethos and or everything that exists of Tucson, like the generations, there's so much knowledge that's, that exists in America. And of course it's everywhere, but like it all got condensed into one place for mm -hmm. a long time, you know? So we did a lot of that and we understood the circuit of who was doing what in America and then what international dealers were bringing their stuff and bringing it to America every year. And that's a lot of the connections that's really found in Tucson because the people who are like the serious go-getters and the serious middlemen and the serious uh, people who are investing in mining projects in their countries of origin are gathering their stuff out right. over the whole year and they're bringing it to Tucson. Right. So and when I get, when I get messages, which I get often from people who are wanting to start out in this business, in this industry, they ask me what to do. How do you get connected? First of all, they ask me if I sell wholesale, then they want to know if I'll give them my wholesale, my vendors contacts. Um, <laughs> I definitely have, I've, I've vacillated in my various responses to that question, but, by and large, my answer to anybody who's asked me if, how to get started in the industry, I tell them to go make connections at the gem shows. Go to Tucson, go to Denver, <clears throat> build up connections. That's what I did. One of, my, 
one of my closest uh, vendors who, I mean, we talk on WhatsApp probably daily. I definitely talk to him in Hong Kong more than I talk to my own mother. And that is just because we're like constantly chatting or I show him pictures of my kids or, you know, we come up and brainstorm ideas. But I met him my very first Tucson. I grilled him with questions about his sourcing of materials and ha his factory and how, um, how the carvers are paid. And now I dream about his, um, his bamboo and eggplant dishes that he makes for me every single Denver and Tucson. I literally have dreams about this meal. And he texted me two days ago or WhatsApped me two days ago. He's like, we're coming to Tucson. I'm like, oh my God, you're going to cook for me, right? And he's like, I can't wait. I mean, that's when you say the relational aspect of it, it's so important. I can't just, even if I wanted to, um, and I don't, just give people my vendors information on Instagram and they never meet these people and they just buy stones from them. I mean, I think there's a way you could find success maybe doing that if all you're chasing is the monetary gain of a success with an online retail business and in, in this industry, but you're missing out on a lot of what the, the crystals are offering us relationally. Um, and I think that like, we can't not talk about the spiritual aspect or the metaphysical aspect because there's something really intangible about it. Even, I mean, you could just love them because they're pretty rocks, but you can't deny the connections that are made over them, right? Of course. I mean, I'm, I'm in awe at how many places around the world, because I, I, so I guess to back up, there's Tucson, and then I started doing international shows. And when you start doing the international shows as exhibitors, then you meet the people who are really running around the world exhibiting, which is a yeah. whole another category to the and sometimes crosses over with the people that are buying in their own markets and stuff. And yeah, yeah. it was just amazing. Like, oh my gosh, look, there's that person that I met in Japan and now I see him in Germany and now I see him in Denver. And it's just like, wait a minute, this is getting too weird. And so the people who are really running around the world doing the international shows is like a, a, a smaller community, but then it's like the same feeling where it's like, wow, like I can't stress enough how cool it is to be like the, having that bond for with the yeah. people that are doing all that stuff. So, yeah. Yeah. and it's the same thing for going to Tucson. I was going to say when you were talking about Tucson, Tucson is a cherry popper. Like I know people that have gone to all the shows and even gone overseas to buy, but if you haven't gone to Tucson, when you go to Tucson, it's like, holy shit. Yeah. What is going on? here like why yeah. this place in the middle of the desert and why i mean it, it's a mind blower and the amount of information even if you don't hustle and really try to obtain as much information as you can you don't even have to just being there you have, right. you you acquire an understanding of the volume of what's going on what the minerals look like where they come from who's doing this who's doing that and it's just like you don't even have to consciously ingest it it will be ingested by yeah. being my very first tucson i took a friend of mine i had like by the middle of December, my sales were so good. It was my first year. I opened in March. I had enough money to like have a budget and take it to Tucson. And so I grabbed a friend who had knew nothing about the industry. We went to my first Tucson. And that was actually one of the first times that she, like she looked around and she was like, how sustainable is this when there are so many minerals because of the, the massive because of the, the enormity of the shows in Tucson during that period of the year, you see so much material out at, at one time. And so for a lay person or for a person who's never been to the mines, a person who's never seen um, these rocks in the ground and how they grow in masses and just how enormous it is, it seems like we're pulling a lot out of the earth. Does that sound accurate to you? Um, it sure looks like it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. But I mean, perspective wise. So I'm curious, like, as we as we talk more, I want to know what you've seen, what you've experienced, what mines look like to you. Oh, I, I guess on a side note, not necessarily of mines, if you're talking about sheer quantity of material, like, yes, you can go to Tucson and be like, oh, my God, look at how much is here. But I can honestly say that if you go to China, I can I, I honestly believe that all of Tucson is in one building in China. Hmm all the time every day it's and it's not the same type of material but if you're talking just about sheer quantity of material i'm like holy shit the market in guangzhou is just as big as tucson and it happens every day all the time and that's one market you know so in terms of volume tucson is overwhelming as, and as a cherry popper for people who haven't been to mines or been to markets but when you go to the markets of where the stuff comes from it's like only a small percentage of the people that sell in those markets bring their wares to tucson and it's cool. country specific yeah 
so like Brazil has a lot more of their material coming because they, they are, have the oldest mineral culture, not like the oldest, you know, India and China have been doing stones more, but in terms of the modern day culture of we're packing our bags and saving everything up and buy, you know, mining our stuff and manufacturing it and bringing it to Tucson, the Brazilians have the longest history and the greatest amount of information that passes back and forth. You know, there's more people in Brazil that have never been to Tucson have more information about the international market than anybody else in any other country, people on the ground who haven't left. Like the people in Pakistan have no idea what goes on in Tucson if they haven't gone in comparison to people in Brazil, even if they haven't gone because so many Brazilians have come and come back with their stories. And you know what I mean? So there is a, that has a lot to do and a lot to say about each country has a, a mining culture. Right. And that changes what they bring and what they know and all that stuff. So, so can you speak on that a little bit more? Like what prevents certain, certain countries and certain miners from those countries having more exposure? Oh, that's a, Big question. I mean, it, obviously, it's very country specific, but it's like uh, <laughs> the first thing that comes to mind for specifically is like Pakistan and Afghanistan probably doesn't have as easy of a time just getting a visa and coming over, for example, yep. to America, you know, whereas Brazil has a little bit of a just a, a better relationship. So there is politics involved on some level. And it's not like cut and dry. Of course, plenty of Pakistanis and Afghanis come over. Um, but I don't know if there's as many visas that are necessarily like openly, yes, bring you, you can all come and whatever from certain countries for one reason or another. And that's politics it doesn't really have anything to do with us, but that is something that does play a little bit involved in that question. Um, as far as other exposure, I think Brazil is number one in terms of their understanding of the worldwide market and what goes on in Tucson for a number of reasons. Uh, one, they produce the most minerals. Mm -hmm. for collectability. Now, of course, there's other places that produce more minerals for industry, but that's not really what we're talking about. We're talking about... Let's talk about minerals produced for industry because a lot of that conversation needs to come up more as we talk about ethically mining crystals for like the small cottage industry that we are in. Like in the great scheme of things, this is a very tiny cottage industry compared to the industrial ore minerals that are mined in giant pit mining situations for the shit that goes into our phones that we're streaming this from right now. Like that's kind of the perspective we need to talk about because it's really easy for people to hop up and shit on people who are collecting quartz clusters. Meanwhile, they're bitching at people on their phones. Right. So we will talk about that. We could talk about it now if you wanted to fold it in. That's uh, probably a big question that we should save for one of your other, I'm sure that's one of your other questions. We can go, whatever, we can talk about it now, but it's fine. Let me see. I'm going to look at my notes. You keep talking. <laughs> um, all right. So I guess the overview to that is that this could be a whole section that we could separate off over here is the concept between commercial industrial mining and artisanal mining and artisanal mining. Uh, the most important thing, the first thing that I always say about artisanal mining is that it is the single, not only, but probably the single most important thing that we have left on the planet that represents true 100% sovereignty. Because an individual, it doesn't matter who you are, you don't have to have an education. All you have to do is use your hands and your willpower. And you got to at least be lucky enough to live in an area where there's minerals that are worth something, but you can create wealth out of just that, your hands mm -hmm. and your willpower. And every other thing in on our planet that is that quote unquote, easy to create wealth has been taken by corporations. So mm -hmm. industrial mining is a concept that exists that we can talk about that's a huge subject and we can, you know, that's like almost a whole different branch of the well, ethical we, part. I don't want to talk about it. I just want to use it in contrast to what we're discussing as far as our industry, because it, sure. the perspective I think is important and that's really it. I mean, I'm not, I'm not an expert on it. I don't think you necessarily are either, but it's enough for us to say like, you know, we just need to have, we need to have bigger perspective. Like sure. you can, you can use a reusable or a paper straw, but as long as the US military industrial complex is like bubble wrapping planes and throwing furniture into the ocean, like it doesn't fucking matter. Use a plastic straw. And this is like, I, okay, that's a, that's a soapbox for another day. <laughs> but it's perspective, that's all. <laughs> yes, totally. So I guess back to that perspective, the difference between industrial mining and artisanal mining, you know, artisanal mining being the last or the, one of the most important sovereign things. Like, so there's a different set of ethics that are involved in both. And a lot of what we do find in our industry does come from commercial mines. And so there's this catch 22. Well, it's like, well, if the big hole in the ground wasn't there, we wouldn't have those minerals at all. So 
that doesn't mean that, that we, you and me would be like, oh, let's tear up the earth to have that. But it's like, it's already there. You know, I, my personal ethos and belief is that the earth provides what we need as individuals, both spiritually and for, you know, part of our spiritual development is through technology. Like we can't deny the fact that our information stream helps us grow in a conscious way. And that's directly related to technology. So technology helps us to evolve. So the minerals that come out that create our phones, even though they make these big giant holes, it's like, well, we wouldn't know about how to do that technique in Tibetan Buddhism that we wouldn't learn unless we went to Tibet, except now that we have the internet and we can figure out how to do that because we have the internet. Yeah. And that's like, that's also a greater conversation to have too. But I want to back up a little bit for people who are maybe unaware of the fact that a lot of our artisanal pieces, specimens come from and are a byproduct of larger industrial mineral mining. So you, you mentioned that, I know that, but I just want to like speak to that a little bit for people who are brand new and don't, you know, don't know anything about that. So in your experience, what minerals are a byproduct of that kind of mining? What are we getting out of that mining where there are already holes in the ground? Uh, I think the, the biggest one, the most, the, the one that comes first to mind is all of the malachite. All of the malachite and that comes from the Congo all comes from giant commercial mines. And most of the copper minerals in general used to come from bigger commercial mines like Sumeb. If you're into mineral specimens, not necessarily polished, like Sumeb was this giant copper mine that was running in the 50s, 60s and 70s. And it happens to be the most prolific mineral specimen site. There's thousands of different types of minerals that are found there. And it's for collectors, it's the absolute number one for, you know, for having so much stuff. And that's not necessarily the, the bend that we need to take, but like commercial mining is necessary for our industry, both for specimens and for the, the polished materials. So the malachite that comes from the Congo um, is a great place to start. Uh, in terms of there's a giant hole in the ground. It's, you know, run by a giant copper company that is probably not treating their people unbelievably well. And in regards to, oh, this is the most ethical. But so the best thing that I can say about that is this. And if you've, if you've ever been to Africa, it's, it makes a huge difference to understand this when you're on the ground. And most people that have never gone can make preconceived notions about how it is and why we need to do this or do that. But until you've been on the ground, it's like, a complete eye opener. So for example, people that are working in a commercial mine, like the Malachite mines in the Congo, they, I, I don't know for sure, but I'm an, under the assumption that they're probably living really crappy lives with low salaries, right? And they're digging ore for the commercial mine. So what happens with the Malachite is the ore, you know, they find this big ore body and they're like, oh, all this black solid copper, this green stuff that we wouldn't use in polishing that's just like the really dense 90% copper, like they're pulling that out and the malachite is a byproduct and they usually leave it there because it's not as pure as like the, the solid copper colored metal. Malachite has less copper in it and it has other minerals in it and whatnot. And it's not really useful for industrial mining because you would have to actually like extract the copper and take the rest of it out. And it's like, they find big chunks of copper and that's what they're going for. So when they, in the, a lot of these mines, when they find and they, they it happens with sujolite too. It's a huge one. They're, they go until they hit the color that we use for lapidary and or all of our stuff and they turn directions and then they go around it and they go mm -hmm. away from it and they leave it there. So they expose it and they leave it. And what that does in terms of, this is where the cool thing about the ethics comes involved, is that the people that may not have great lives working in these commercial mines, they and their families, they go into these mines at night and they take out the malachite and they put, them in, they put it in their pocket and it's basically a bonus for them. And that is a blessing because it gives them extra income and it helps them to step one step closer out of the situation of poverty or whatever the negative connotations are that we could say they're, if they're not being treated well. It's like, it, another thing is that it's their choice. In places like Africa, there is not a lot of, not a lot of opportunity. And you know, so it's kind of like, well, do you do nothing and really suffer because you can't make any living whatsoever? Or do you go work at the mine? You know, And it's like, I'm not gonna state which is better, but when you're in a situation of dire need and you can't just go like find something on the ground that makes you money, you gotta go work for something of the opportunity that's there. And in a lot of third world countries, there is not a lot of opportunity. So they go to these commercial mines. So the 
the hole in the ground already exists. The malachite is exposed. They turn the other direction to get the really thick ore body material and they leave the malachite and then the people come in and they take it and they make money on the side. So the part that we sell and how it relates to ethics is really interesting because if they were only mining and putting those people in those situations to mine the malachite for us, then we could probably say like, eh, maybe we shouldn't do that, you know, like because they're doing it just for us and maybe that's not great unless it's their only opportunity. But it's creating a better life for them because they're in a situation where there isn't a lot of opportunity. They're working in a, probably a less uh, ideal condition, but we give them a little bit of hope where they can take that extra wealth and, this, and create at least a little bit of sovereignty. You know, maybe they can afford something else or maybe some of them even as a family group together and they figure out how to build a house or they find a way to get away from the commercial mine. Right. It's really impossible to know though who is benefiting in this way and where it's coming from unless you've created and fostered those relationships with miners or directly with your vendors who maybe are the middleman or the middle person for the miners and the final product that you then purchase as a retailer. So it's really, I mean, I think what I want to make sure that we touch on tonight too is this, how really impossible it is to say that everything we source is ethically mined. There's no way to know the origins of absolutely every mineral you might carry in your shop, I might carry in my shop, um, that we can do our absolute best, but it would maybe be a, a decade, if not two, of just traveling to each of the mines where we source all of our minerals to, to even lay eyes on it. Yeah, I think one of the biggest questions really is taking a huge step back and being, well, what is ethical? What does it mean? And usually the two questions are, are they getting paid enough and are their living and working conditions good enough? You know what I mean? Just for like basic survival and whatnot. And well, yeah, up to the standard of that country too. I mean, we have to talk about like, you know, when I was in Tanzania and my big regret of being in Tanzania is not like stuffing all the Tanzanite into my bag and bringing it home was that, you know, you could buy, you could buy a full house at the base of Mount Kilimanjaro um, and it was $2,000. But we have to talk about economics and the equivalent in USD to that. There are a lot of people who see um, workers mining in flip-flops or sandals or open-toed shoes. And there's a, lot of, there's a lot of misunderstanding of what is appropriate, what is safe, what is considered safe, what miners actually, in certain countries, what they feel more comfortable working in as well. I mean, it's just so incredibly nuanced that it's really impossible to say, like, I mean... Aside from like head protection, <laughs> like what well, well, so in general, that also backs up to if, if third world countries in general, if you haven't been, it's really hard to understand just what life is like. And a, a very small analogy, I remember being on the island of Bali one time and they're really tiny roads because it's an island and they're zooming past with cars and motorbikes. And I just remember parents letting their kids play out on the street and the kids are literally five inches from the road and five another five inches from the car tires that are going I mean literally less than a foot from car tires driving past every five seconds and it's like what is the value of life how much safety is it is there in their actual country of origin and that has nothing to do with mining so it was a big eye-opener to go to two places where it's like oh like the standard of living and or quality of life is different in their 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 value of life is different, you know, just because life is hard. So let your kid go out and play in the street and maybe they won't get hit by a car. And I'm not saying that's right. That's just how it is. And it doesn't have anything to do with mining. So it relates to mining. And somebody's asking to um, speaking on the chemical extraction of fluoride in China. Let's talk about the effects of earth and mining practices like that. There are so many layers to this. We're talking about the human aspect now, but there's also the environmental aspect as well. So, I mean, I think the two are linked and layered. Um, what do you think about that? What do you think about the environmental impact? Well, artisanal mining has very little impact. Uh, artisanal mining is people digging holes with shovels and sometimes with excavators and it leaves holes in the ground. And those holes, if you were to look at them side by side, compared to like a lithium mine, you'd be like, oh yeah, that's, that's okay. You know, look at the lithium mine and you're like, whoa, there's like a thousand feet down with like 50 layers and it's like, that's a hole, you know, like that's digging down to the bone of the earth. And so I'm not, I can't say, is that right? Is that wrong? Because we're on phone and all that, that those minds exist so that we can have technology, right. uh, you know, but there is a huge impact in, in commercial mining. And is it, is it wrong? Does it hurt the earth? That's a very good question. I, I can't answer that. I would say 
there's a catch 22 here because I really honestly believe that the earth provides us what we need as a person and as a species when we need it. And in our little that in terms of commercial mining, you know, capitalism can get away from itself and we can overproduce and we can make big holes, which maybe there's ways to do it and not create those big holes. I'm, I'm, I'm not a geologist. I'm not a hydrologist or anything like that, you know, so I don't, I can't comment on that, but there is a, uh, the commercial mining, of course, there has to be some kind of impact that is like, well, maybe that's not great for the earth, you know? So it's kind of a catch 22 because we're talking about it on the phone. So. <laughs> right. And there's also, I mean, different minerals form in different conditions. And so not every, not every mineral that we work with or sell is going to be mined in the same way. Um, but by and large, compared to the industrial minerals, the artisanal minerals are a little there. Are they not higher in the crust of the earth that it's, you're not having to go down, you know, thousands of feet to get deep down into a lithium mine? Yes, correct. You definitely don't have to go that deep. Uh, back to the actual question I'm reading, I'm reading here. That's not artisanal. The chemical extraction of fluoride in China isn't artisanal. Of course it's not. Um, chemical extraction of minerals. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to advocate and be like, that's great. You know what I mean? Um, sometimes that's just how you have to get the minerals out. You, you, part of the devil's advocate is that, you know, the chemicals are also part of nature, but they can create toxicities and pool up in areas. So there, there's nothing great about that you know i'm I, I can't speak in a positive light on the chemical extraction of, of fluoride and say yeah that's great we should do it you know what i mean i mean and that's like this is kind of part of it is having these really uncomfortable conversations and you know not shying away from a hard question but also not making up an answer if we don't know the answer um nothing is without impact on the earth nothing is without impact on other people and communities around you um I think maybe because crystal collectors and mineral collectors, it is, it is artisanal and it's seen as, and it, and it is largely, um, um, it's not, a, it's not an essential need that it's just, it's also a really easy target. I feel like for um, speaking on the environmental and humanitarian impact, and of course it's important. That's why we're having this conversation in the first place, but we could also talk about how veganism is maybe not completely sustainable either because <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to do it because plants need blood and bone and shit and that's what plants need to eat. Um we can't feed plants vegan. I mean it's a whole slippery slope but the point is, is that it's all very interconnected. Um and we're not going to like solve the world's problems tonight. Christina and Rusty don't have the capability of doing that. I know. Shocker, right? But I will say this, this is a good interjection. Um, and this is, I'm not skirting the question of this because there is bad stuff about the chemical extraction of Florida and, and that group of things. But here's, here's what I think about it on an energetic level. And this, uh, this uh, I apply this to things like, uh, like Facebook and other places where it's catch 22s are necessary evils. Um, when we, I, there, I use the word transmutation a lot. You know, there might be something bad that happens, but if we take the byproduct of something that might not necessarily be healthy and we use it for positive intention, then that sort of counterbalances the fact that this bad stuff is happening, but it's not something that we're doing, but we're kind of like, hey, let's make a silver lining or a better, you know, out of this situation, let's try to do, let's transmute the energy and, and create positivity out of it. Yeah, without spiritually bypassing, which is also a tricky thing to do. Yes, definitely. Right? Um, okay, <laughs> so no, I'm I'm right there with you, Rusty and I. We're we're in agreement about a lot of things. I'm also really hyper aware of the the spiritual aspects that this industry um, perpetuates that can be incredibly harmful and toxic to uh, most people's mental health as well, because spiritual bypassing is an issue. So it's kind of like, as we, I'm there with you. And I appreciate that every time you say that, you say that it's your personal belief that X, Y, and Z, because it's really important to not completely disconnect our spirituality or our hearts or our um, emotions with this industry from the concrete issues of the ethics of it. We can do both at the same time. Um, <laughs> I've learned this in my 30s. <laughs> I'm evolving. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, my next question, I think we've kind of rambled through and it, and answered. Um, so in your experience, what does an ethical mine look like? 
Like, what does it look like that, what, is, what do happy miners look like? What does a um, healthy mining situation look like? I mean, in my mind, it's first and foremost safety gear for miners that they have um, head protection, physical bodily protection, but also that they're paid fair wages for their, for their economy, that their families are taking care of, that they are taking care of um, financially speaking and physically speaking. Yeah, definitely. I mean, those are all really important things. And, uh, you know, so there's, there's in places like Brazil, there is artisanal mining where they're only mining for specimens, but that have governmental processes. Like Brazil is in the last five years has gotten very strict about exporting, making sure that the mines are legal and that they're registered. And then, you know, when, and this is for mining specimens or even cutting rough. So there's plenty of mines in Brazil. You could call them artisanal, but they are bigger mines that are producing mineral specimens. And that's the only thing that they're producing. And that's what they're going for. A lot of those places do have regulations, uh, particularly in Brazil. And there's countries like Tanzania who are uh, instilling regulations where they're trying to make sure that the miners get their fair cut, that the uh, safety regulations are in place and that the government comes and makes checks. And there's also a catch-22 there because we don't really want to necessarily open the door and be like, hey, we love government. Come and like watch everything that we're doing because government is government. And we know that the, in reality, like their ethics are not necessarily in line and they're just going to want to come and rape and pillage and take everything that we make. And so there's a balance there. But, it, you know, in places like Brazil, it's really cool. On some level, it's cool, but that there's the regulations and stuff. They probably, I, I don't know all the specifics about each minor Brazil, um, but I've learned that, you know, they, I'm sure that they're involved with wages, they're involved with safety, they're involved with uh, just the workplace, both being safe and also ethical in regards to how the people live and the, the community around them. I mean, I'm sure that they have a lot to do with that in places like Brazil. Um, in totally other places that are not as developed, like in Africa, the, as far as what it, because I do want to say it's not that Africa is not developed because and you've also said third world a couple times and I, I have to because it's just it's critically important that we talk about as we're talking about Africa and mining, particularly from that continent, that continent has been heavily, heavily, heavily colonized and raised to the ground. And the the governmental structures of individual countries have really struggled with a lot of corruption, not because it is inherently African to do so, but because it is inherently the result of colonization by the Belgian, French, English. I mean, so we have to say, like, I just want to call attention to saying that something is undeveloped because it is more crippled. It's it has been cut off at the knees. Um, by colonization and racism. So I have Absolutely. to thank no, you. That, I, that's totally <laughs> legit. I, I agree. Um, there also is an infrastructure issue and just a lack of a lack right. of infrastructure is really what, to colonization. Right. 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 Totally. Uh, I mean, I, I, yeah, I totally agree with you. And I think that that has a lot to do with why some countries and continents like Africa have a different set of parameters of what is ethical and what is not ethical because of their history and what they've gone through. Um, I don't know if there is the same type of regulations and when i speak of africa like a lot of time i mean africa is huge we definitely can't put all of africa in one box most right. of my history is from southern africa from the congo down to south africa you know, once you get into west africa like i don't really know anything about west africa and i don't know too much about north africa i've never been to either one of those places so so my experience in africa is the southern part which is like a completely different set of scenarios um one thing that comes to mind that like affects uh, what's a healthy mining area or region is the, the, the weather. In, in Southern Africa, there's a rainy season where it's like, get everything done before the rains come because the rains come and they stick around for like months. And yeah. if you've seen any kind of videos, I mean, there's tons of videos of like, just to get, you know, there's even, there's different, the stages of, you get it out of the ground and then it's like, okay, well, it's out of the ground. Now what do we do? You got to get it to the nearest road. And then you got to get it to the nearest town and then you got to get to the nearest city and then you got to get it to the port. And every one of those has a different set of logistics and different set of complications and minerals aside, anything that happens during the rainy season, it's a muddy mess everywhere because there's no concrete anywhere in the bush at all, you know? So once the mining, the mining season stops, once the rains come in and that has a lot to do with, okay, well, 
I mean, I guess it's kind of hard to go and talk about how that relates to ethics because we that they don't they don't really mind at that time. Um, but it, it it a lot of the stuff is affected straight by the environment that they're in and the weather they come through. Um, so we're, we're, ask me the next question <laughs> or right. continue on continue where we were. I, I kind of got lost there. No, 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 you're fine. Um, what do you think are some of the most problematic problematic minerals or countries to source from? Well, there's places and that are inverse. Sorry, someone asked the inverse of that, which is which uh, I'm scrolling back up. Um, is there's a is there is there a country that's known to be more ethical than others? I mean, I think you you had already spoken to Brazil. Last five years, they've come down with a lot more regulations, which, you know, straight up makes all of the stuff that we purchase more expensive. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, you know, because we're supporting the regulations which help the miners. Um, the actual question of which are which are the most ethical and some of the least ethical. I mean, that's like a very loaded question. I will definitely go out of my way and call out China because China is very easy to target of like, hey, there's a bunch of stuff that goes on here that's questionable. And having been on the ground there, like I haven't been to a lot of the mines in China, but just in general, China's like, oh, we need that mountain, take it down. And I mean, they take it down, gone, you know? And it's just like, they have 1.7 billion people. So where is the line where it's like, well, they need these things to support their people because they have such a huge population. And then they're also like very much just do whatever and they don't care about pollution as much and that's why it's really dirty there and super smoggy i mean there's certain days where it's super clear and the next day it's like oh my god what the hell i can't even see the skyscrapers like it's crazy it's like literally being in new york and being on top at, at in the in one of these tall buildings and looking out at me like where's the rest of the city like i've been in china where you can't even see the buildings next to it so hmm. as a whole you know china and their regulations of what they do there are are definitely push the limits and of of the ethics of all aspects of their culture and let's be clear too we're talking about the chinese government we're not talking about the chinese people because it's really important especially after covid that there has been a lot of um a lot of anti-asian rhetoric and it's been um it's been a very dangerous and um very disrespectful and unkind approach to anybody from china i've sometimes had people come into my lives. And if I have something from my vendors in China, um, either they've carved it there or something sourced there, you know, there's kind of this, like, at least here in the U S there's this black and white. Um, are we pausing a lot? Some, okay. A couple of people said that it paused, but, um, that there's just this like black and white thinking when it comes to sourcing in China. Um, and we need to be really careful that we're not vilifying, an entire country of people, but we're talking about governmental regulations and mismanagement of a country <laughs> from your perspective. Yeah, so it, it, a lot of it has to do with the size. Like in any country, even in America, in any city, you're gonna have some percentage of people who aren't good. That's just across the board, it's human nature. We, we can't deny that. We don't know what the percentage is. We don't need- We're good. Can you hear me? Go ahead, yeah. Okay, no, yeah, so- I think apparently, apparently we're good now. Okay, sweet. Um, yeah, so everywhere is going to have some percentage of bad apples and, and every situation in any industry, the bad apples make the other, make all of the good apples not look good. Because when you go to Amazon and look at reviews, you know, some review may have a thousand good reviews, but they have 10 bad ones. And you read the bad ones, you're like, oh, I don't want to buy that product. It's like, and the tiny amount of negativity can overshadow all of the stuff that's really good. Yeah, I think it's, but I'm also speaking to like massively overgeneralization and stereotyping that's rooted in, you know, racism and xenophobia and, and hatred and fear. Like, it's just, I feel like it just, I just needed, you don't have to even speak on it. I just had to say it for people who are maybe new to this conversation or are not really doing this work yet. Like somebody asked earlier what spiritual bypassing is. Spiritual bypassing is when you use some kind of uh, religious rhetoric or spiritual belief to override a very real human experience and say, 
you know, for instance, oh, did that horrible thing happen to you? It must be your karma. So you've burned off that karma. Well, even if you believe that to be true, it's spiritual bypassing to brush off someone's very painful, perhaps traumatic experience by not speaking to it in the moment and just chalking it up to karma. <laughs> like, so anyway, Rusty, it's not a challenge to you in any mean, in any way. It's just making sure that like, what needs to be said and clarified is out there for I, people who I, are wise, like, you know, they get their pitchforks ready and they want to vilify an entire group of people. That's super problematic. And it's our collective shadow just rearing its ugly head. So I have to go to the other side of that shadow too. And I have to continue to basically call out China. And it has a lot to do with what I just said, because it is the bad apples not necessarily the good apples. And so there's the smaller percentage that makes the good apples sort of look like everybody is a bad apple and you can vilify the whole country. But since China is so big, they have more bad apples per capita. And so we feel and experience a lot of stuff. So part of the problem in China is that as a culture, there is somewhat of an ingrained lack of ethics. And it's not necessarily in everyone, but they love to reproduce things that are fake they love to steal ideas they love to like create that fake thing and then not tell anyone about it and put it on the market and it's like they have the ability to do that because they have such a huge industry and so many so much capacity to put that stuff together you know so i believe right, i come from a place where i love china i've been to china 20 times i can't wait to go back to china again i don't know if i'll ever get to go back to china again but i love it i love china and i love the chinese people they're also very harsh and very hard and they're very uh they lack a lot of emotion and it's part of their culture and that's not necessarily a negative trait it's just a, an observation um and going back to what i was saying you know like there is a part of their culture that does lack ethics and what's interesting about china is that if you understand their payment system the way that they pay each other within china like i have an agent on the ground and when i want to buy something from china like if it's an expensive item uh he will have i will commit to it and he will buy it and ship it to him and check it out and then show me pictures from his own phone and then he'll send it to me and what happens is there's always built into their culture built into their payment system there is a i'm going to only pay a deposit i'm going to get the item and check it and make sure that it's okay and that you're not screwing me on this item and then i'm going to finish paying for it and send it all along where either keep it or send it along sway so there's enough corruption and the, there's enough of the Chinese people screwing each other over time and through history as a cultural phenomenon to where they had to build something into their payment system to make sure that they didn't screw each other over. Mm -hmm. um, and what's really interesting about that is that that doesn't cross over into how they sell overseas. And so there's a lot of bad apples that go on the internet and then they make mistakes and they sell to Westerners or any other places and they are intentionally trying to scam. And there's more in China than in anywhere else in the world because they have 25% of the population and they're really good at using the internet and they have a lot of capacity. So, but what the bad apples actually like sh sort of overshadow the fact that there's 99% of the people in China who are selling overseas and selling into their own country are totally fine and totally legit. You know, like I know people that are like, I won't buy Moldavite from China. I will not buy Moldavite from China. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care where they got it. I, it's all fake. And I understand the sentiment and I, you know, but it's everyone's personal choice. If you want to choose that, that's fine. I, I personally, I do buy Moldavite in China, but I've been there enough and I have enough experience with Moldavite so that I know when it's real. And I have people on the ground that can verify that the seller is absolutely legit because everything else that they sell is legit and they have a reputation in China that can be checked as selling legitimate stuff. And, you know, you can go and it's, I mean, with Moldavite, it's easy because for the most part, it's easy to tell what Moldavite is fake if you have experience, especially the Chinese Moldavite, because China has a market for fakes within China. They make fake stuff in China and they advertise it as fake stuff because there are people who cannot afford the real stuff. And therefore it is a market that thrives in China. It spills over into the rest of the world and we just throw a hissy fit because we don't understand that they made it to sell to themselves because they want to, they can't afford the good stuff with Moldavite, with Amethyst. I mean, there's, they fake everything and they don't do it. They don't create that market so that they can just fool Westerners. They do it because there are Chinese people who want to buy that stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's a thriving market. There's plenty of people who've made millions and huge companies that have been made on fake shit. But in China, it's known that it's fake shit. And they generally don't go out of their way to be like, hey, this is real, but it's not because right. they just don't.
Now, when it crosses over into the Western hemisphere, a lot of times through the internet, there are the bad apples that are like, oh, just tell them it's real or they won't even know. And they're, pretend there's a language barrier or maybe there is a language barrier. And that 1% or half a percent or a tenth of a percent or whatever it is, they make the other 99% and make the whole country look bad. And then there's people who are like, I won't buy Moldavite in China. And there's a part of me that's like, that's totally legit because there's enough of that stuff on the internet that creates the perception mm -hmm. that a lot of Chinese people are less ethical. That doesn't mean that there's a greater percentage of Chinese people that are less ethical. It's just that the bad apples are completely overshadowing all of this really good ethical dealing that does go on in China in, in country of origin and overseas. Okay, I've seen a couple of people asking too about Madagascar. Um, what's your experience with Madagascar? Have you been? I haven't been to Madagascar, but I know a lot of people who have gone and I know that it is very similar to a lot of things that go on in Africa and the way that Africa is structured. And Madagascar is tough. It's just Africa. All of Africa is tough. Africa is not for the faint of heart. It is not, for lack of a better word, for sissies. Like you cannot be weak and go to Africa and expect to work there on a regular basis. Yeah, like, yes, go to Madagascar and have an experience that, and for a couple of weeks, whatever, that's one thing, but like, it's just rough living. And most of Africa is like that because there's not a lot of resources. There's a lot of people in a small amount of places and a small amount of space. So to, you know, to answer the question, like I see videos of like new sapphire mines and things in Madagascar and it's literally like, oh, there's sapphires and 3000 people show up and they just fight to dig holes and it just looks awful. It's like, wow, that looks terrible. but. At the same time, like, what are they pulling out of the ground? I mean, they're pulling out stuff out of the ground that's a hundred dollars gram, two hundred dollars gram, you know. And maybe that's what the middleman sells it for, but they're, you know, they're still getting twenty, thirty, fifty dollars a gram for some of this gem rough that comes out of the ground. So it's like, is it bad that they're like rushing to this place and living in really like squalor type shitty situations when they're also like, hey, look, I found one this big. Shit, I could buy a house now. I mean, it's like it's a catch twenty two. Um, hmm. You know, having said that, I, there, I'm sure there's places in Madagascar, like there, you know, places where they dig things that are not very expensive. It's got to be hard living, you know, like it's just there's an aspect of it that's not pretty. And is it ethical? I mean, I, I know there's a lot of big companies in Madagascar. And, you know, one of my friends here locally that is one of the bigger dealers and uh, buyers in Madagascar, uh, Enter the Earth, you know, he's been, you know, him. of course, you go to his websites and go to his store and he has 150 workers in his factory, you know, and it's just like, it's huge. And in a lot of ways, uh, you know, I know that there are in factories like that, that there's definitely ethics that go on because there's people that are overseeing that. So there is the colonization aspect of it still kind of exists. It's not necessarily with the negative. Oh, intent. Absolutely. Well, I mean, like when our friends go there and they set up factories, technically that's still colonization, Absolutely. even if they're treating them well. It's not like it was in the 1800s where they're like, hey, we're going to shoot you and we just killed your wife and we're going to take all your shit. And you're going to work for us. It's not no. like that, but it still exists. Yeah. So let's talk about sourcing ethically. What do you do? Do you claim to source in any way sustainably? If you do, what does that look like? What kind of uh, what kind of material are you sourcing in that way? And what do you suggest for crystal shops who are starting out and they want to do things the right way? And by the well, right way, I mean with integrity. Right. Um, well, there's a big difference between buying on the internet and buying in person. How so? And, well, you, anybody can literally go on Facebook or Instagram and find some random person in country of origin that's selling something. And you have literally no idea anything about them other than what they're showing you. And I'm not implying that they're bad or that that's not ethical, but you have no idea. So when you're buying in person, you have at least the chance to experience the relationship and you can understand where these people are coming from, you know? So, uh, so for people that are new and new crystal shops, like the first thing, obviously just go to big mineral shows, go to the wholesale shows where international dealers show up. That's the best place to start because you can experience those people and you can ask them questions and you can get to know what they do. And a lot of these people are the, the middlemen or the mine owners in country of origin. Like you can go and find the most important mineral dealers in say Peru, in Tucson. If you wanna know the biggest dealers in a lot of these countries, you can, and, and they have huge mining projects, whether they're even their own mines or they're buying from the market. So they have hundreds of people working for them. Like you can go and ask them these questions yourself. Um, so by, buying on the internet, obviously you can stab in the dark and you can find those companies if they exist on the internet, which a lot of them do. And you can also go and literally find 
some totally random person in Indonesia that like gets around on his motorbike and doesn't know anything about mining. And, you know, Indonesia is a really good place to use as an example um, because they happen to have a whole lot of sellers on the internet that are not actual owners. The way that it works in Indonesia, they do not have a very well developed mining uh, culture. And there's only three to five, maybe six truly large companies in Indonesia. And by large, they're not like any other countries that are well established. Like these companies could very easily be taken over by international people. Who come. They don't get everything. They don't have a clamp down of control where when somebody finds something, they go to these people like that does exist. But in other places, like there is a very strict pecking order where it's like, oh, I found this tourmaline in Brazil. I'm going to go to that guy because he's got a billion dollars and he's going to buy it from me. And, and I just know that he'll pay the right price. You know, in Indonesia, it's not like that. The, the, the biggest miners or the biggest dealers and people who have the greatest influence in Indonesia are barely millionaires. They don't really have the ability to uh, start huge mining projects all over Indonesia. So what's interesting about Indonesia is that there's five, about five huge companies, or I mean, then they're individuals with workers and stuff. And they, for some reason, instead of selling it themselves on the internet, they have what I, this is terrible. I shouldn't use this word, but I call them, I call them the Indonesian fleas because there's literally like, yeah, there's so many of them. Word. No. What? <laughs> I said, Sorry, yeah. I can't use that word. All right, I can't use that word. Sorry, I, all right, all right. There's, there's a million people on the internet from Indonesia that go to the five main people and they are middlemen and they get pictures. They don't have the material in hand and they try to solicit people. And it's a pretty endemic issue on places like Facebook. There is a lot, particularly Indonesia and Pakistan. There's so many people who don't have the material in hand. They're trying to broker it. Their friend has the material or the mine owner has the material and you know, Westerners will make a payment to this person's account and this person has no accountability whatsoever and say they like showed you this and you bought this, but this got sold over here in between the time that this person was showing it and somebody else was showing it that was also there that same day taking pictures. And then the guy in the middle gets caught and can't provide the material. And, you know, there's there's so many gaps in the situation, particularly yeah. in that country. And it came up earlier too, that again, needs to be like addressed and said that people are doing their absolute best. They're doing the best for their families, for their loved ones, for themselves. I mean, I, I'm a mom, so I know that humans are inherently like a tad violent, like it's just kind of built in. We kind of like hurt each other regularly, but also, you know, there's, there has to be some understanding that there are that people are trying and doing their best. And I mean, any, any crystal seller, any retailer on Instagram will, will attest to the fact that the, the high percentage of Indonesian sellers in our DMs and our requests to buy or to sell material is proportionately higher than anywhere else. Um, and I think what you're speaking to about that is, is a cultural aspect that I'm not qualified to speak on. Um, but it's, it's something that I have seen in my experience and going back to the original question, of course, which is how do I source as ethically as possible? Um, meeting people, I think is a really big aspect of that. Um, having conversations with people to the best of your abilities. Um, if you cannot go to the country, um, then go to the major gem shows. Um, I think, you know, I think it's really important that we talk about people doing their best. Um, as you and I are also doing our best <laughs> to, uh, there have not been too many questions. There have been some, um, there have been some comments, some funny, some, um, some very interesting, but not a lot in, in terms of like feedback or, or questions. Sorry, I, I read the word feedback. As I said that questions from the viewers at the moment. So those of you who are in here now, if you have questions, ask them, this is the time knowing too, that. Rusty and I have limited, you know, limited knowledge on very specific country specific minds, um, specific cultures. I know it's really tempting to be like, um, you know, there's part of me that wants to be like, well, Rusty, let's talk a little bit more about the Congo because I'm really careful about that. I've seen a couple questions about Laramar in the Dominican Republic. Um, let me see. Um, I've made a few relationships with a few people. They're literally, they'll video call you from, from the mine. Absolutely. Like sometimes you'll see photos or videos. I mean, and again, it's about trust. We talked about trust um, in the very beginning and 
doing this ethically, I think requires a lot of trust or consciously requires a lot of trust. I do want to speak once more about just the con. So we talked about obviously buying from people in person is the, is the best way to get to know them. Yeah. But that's not always possible. It's not always possible to go to gem shows. And then of course with COVID and everything, a lot of the international buyer, the international sellers are not coming. So all, almost all of us, like it's, even me, like I haven't traveled in two years. It's blowing my mind, but like we're all sourcing online. And so that's probably the most important aspect of, well, how do I source online and make sure that, things are ethical. And like I touched on it a little bit, it's not, impo it's not impossible to do a little bit of research, but it's also impossible to know all the situations. But I would, you know, without going too far deep into it, I would say for people that are sourcing online, do a little bit of research and look at these people who you're buying from and go and look at their pictures and show you what they're showing and show, uh, look at what they're showing and look at the, the, the range of what they have that they ha have to offer. And, you know, they may be stealing pictures and just be middlemen, but like in a lot of scenarios, if somebody's dealing in multiple types of stones and they show themselves at multiple types of mining areas and whatnot, and they show themselves in markets, like their information that they give you can give you a better understanding of where they are in the pecking order in the industry in their country of origin. Because they're literally just random people with a cell phone who are trying to sell you something they don't have that have no liability, no accountability, and possibly not very good ethics and i'm not going to call them out but there's people that are steps above that that are like hey i'm a middleman and i'm making a living just by wholesaling other people's stuff but i do it in a way where if, if there's a problem i can help fix it because i've built myself up a little bit you know and because i have these connections where you know you just got to do a little bit more research and understand and talk to the people and ask them like who they know and who like what they know about their cultural uh the culture of their mineral mining and stuff because there's a lot of people who don't know anything and they're on the internet and they're trying to sell you something because they're desperate and they need to and they are not always the best people to buy from because they don't have accountability well and also understanding your own cultural bias and your own cultural biases and then your your limited understanding of of other cultures especially if you haven't traveled um <laughs> thanks bella <laughs> chiming in um, we had a question. I scrolled back up. What is it that you look for prior to making business? Hold on. To making sure they're an ethical company. What do you look for when you're starting out working with a new vendor? I think is more the question. Um, a lot of the answers come in their integrity and how they deal with complications, logistics, problems. Do they want to help you solve issues? You know, like it's not not all business is smooth, you know, and even from the beginning, a lot of times um, things can come up and how the, the, the key moments of how those things are dealt with uh, can tell you a lot about how somebody's going to treat you or if they're going to be able to make right in a, in a situation. So how to select new vendors? I mean, I, it's it's. it's kind of an open question i'm not really sure how to answer it super effectively because a lot of it is stabbing in the dark and a lot of that is the way that business is if you're a new business a lot of how you learn is making mistakes and i'm not saying go out there and make mistakes but you got to take risks with risk comes reward so sometimes it's like oh man that looks really good and that person looks like a good dealer but i don't know them and i got to take a risk and oh i got screwed and then you learn not to do that again or put other steps in place like today <laughs> this is a good example i had a friend that showed me some shark's teeth from indonesia and they were literally 12 inches big, like huge, like, and I'm like, that's not possible. That's gotta be fake because it's too good to be true. And like, they are perfect. And, I'm, and I had to ask some of my, my suppliers, I was like, go find out if these are real or not, because there are people that are totally making fakes that are intentionally trying to stay, take your money. But there, it's like, if something is too good to be true, expect it to be too good to be true there are definitely chances out there where you can totally win and you can find something that seems too good to be true. And it actually is true, but you got to take the risks sometimes. Yeah. You know? Mistakes are inevitable. I've made mistakes too. I've not purchased 12 inch long fake shark teeth, but my mistakes <laughs> are my own. Right. <laughs> so fair For enough. Sure. Um, so I'm seeing, uh, I'm seeing really some specific questions that I don't think we're qualified to answer about very specific minerals. Um, yes, businesses don't usually like to share their sources with other businesses. <laughs> um, someone's asked me about China and I'm not going there again. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not seeing 
Um, ask the vendor for referrals from other shops that will legitimize them. I mean, I guess you could do that too. Um, I've, I've had situations where vendors have shared personal information with me about a vendor, like a, a colleague of mine, another retailer. Um, and I've had to tell them that that's not appropriate. I wouldn't appreciate them sharing my information with somebody else, even though, and they're like, but you're friends. And I'm like, but it's business. That's not appropriate. Um, so yeah, that's not, that's not cool. Um, do you ask your wholesaler for photos of their behind the scenes? Um, or do you have to take their words? I mean, I have asked some vendors. I mean, this is where it gets kind of like, for me anyway, when I'm sourcing, this is where it gets a little, um, more more intuitive and emotional because i feel like i i can trust my intuition when i first start working with somebody whether i feel like i need to see it or not or whether i feel like i can work with them based on the answers to my questions um so i mean i think that's that's individual to each to each their own as far as your the crystal sellers that you guys are buying from not me and not me and rusty what i will i will say uh when buying online, it is a really good idea to ask for in situ fit photos. I did today. The first thing I said about the shark's tooth was show me them coming out of the ground. Because then I know that there's a better chance that they're not fake, but that doesn't mean they can't fake that. So in general, like asking for photos of the stuff coming out of the ground, asking for photos of the people who are manufacturing and or digging the people, if they're middlemen, they might just get those photos from someone else to appease you. But the more you, the more they can provide, the closer they are to actually do the source. Yeah. You know, if they're if they're pulling random stuff off the internet and it's Photoshop doctored photos versus like show me what it really looks like. So a lot of times, you know, like my my number one Indonesian supplier who I have met in person and he manufactures for me. I have a very deep relationship with him because we've done lots of stuff. But I'll send him photos from Indonesia and I'll be like, wow, look at this quality, go find this. And he was like, Rusty, it keeps happening. You got to understand they're showing you the 0.00001% making it look like all of it's that quality and they're doctoring the photos. And then he goes and he goes to the mine owner and he asks the mine owner for pictures of the material coming out of the ground right now. And he sends it to me and I could literally share that with you either now or later or after or whatever and be like, look, this is what I was shown, what I got excited about. Yeah. And and then this is what my guy showed me of what yeah. it actually looks like. Yeah, put it in your stories later, if you can. That would be great to see, you know, to see how it's, I mean, we're, we're sailing uncharted territory here. We are, the, the mineral industry may have been around for a really long time, but the way that we're doing the things right now is like, it's like a, not even adolescent. It's not even hit puberty yet. This is really, really bizarre and new and requires that we um, have a, an intuitive and um, an intuitive understanding too of people through a screen that we're able to read um, tone and gesture and intonation and and subtleties through text and possibly across language barriers and you know I mean video chat definitely helps when you're talking to people. So there was another question too that that was really funny. Do you trust wholesalers that don't show their face? And I would say like I don't. I don't think I've worked with any wholesalers that I haven't seen their face or video chatted with them or met them first in person. Anybody that I really work with online, I have already met in person. I've established that first as a physical relationship and then through the virtual means that we have across the world. Um, yeah, but. smartphones are only 13 years old and they have completely revolutionized our entire planet and specifically this industry because before you know, we were sending photos by email and that was how we were seeing stuff on the ground. And it was like, that was only 13 years ago where we didn't I have- I know, I'm old enough to remember too. <laughs> <laughs> you still a baby, why you do that? <laughs> still a baby. Um, somebody else had a question. So how do you suggest regular customers vetting people we want to buy from? I think meaning customers buying from retailers like us. What do you suggest? How do you vet the retailers? Or yeah. how do you vet how do you vet the retail? How did they feel about shopping with us, the people that are us? Well, uh, I mean, y your primary, uh, I assume, I, your primary place that you sell is on Instagram. So uh, obviously you can look at the number of followers that doesn't really give any kind of ratings or anything, but when somebody has followers. another store, you know, you, like for me, it's really easy. You can go to my Etsy shop and you can see that we have 60,000 positive reviews. You know what I mean? It's like, Oh, okay. And 250,000 sales. So it's like, that's different. <laughs> Toot -toot. It's, but 
But so in general, that's why those rating systems exist. Oh, hi. Bye, Bella's here done torturing us with the yeah. tape and the paper. You know, just as a side note, they have a uh, tape that doesn't make noise for moments like this. You should buy a roll of that. <laughs> it's really loud. Thank you, Bella. Bye. Bye. So, um, yeah, so, okay, say the last thing that you said. Oh, follower count doesn't matter. Yeah, I mean, so honestly, ask your friends. But like, for, for accounts like yours, where you're, you're pretty well known. So it's like, if I've come to you for the first time, I'm like, oh, who is this lady? It's pretty easy to go ask five people that you know, and one of them is going to know you and be like, oh my God, her reputation is great. And I talked to this other person, her reputation is great. Like word of mouth is by far the most important thing in this yeah. industry on yeah. every level, wholesale, retail, manufacturing, all of it. You know, so ask your peers, ask the people that are shopping with the vendors, you know, even if they're new vendors, use the rating systems, you know, like they exist for a reason. If somebody's a brand new Etsy shop and they only have five sales, but they're all positive reviews, that's a good sign. If one out of five isn't, give them a little bit more time maybe, you know? Could take another hour where I shit on Etsy pretty hard. So I know Rusty's like top 80 worldwide shops on Etsy ever of all time. So no, truly, it's, that's amazing. And that's quite a feat. Um, but Etsy, Etsy is really not kind to sellers and the stars, the star seller system, that's absolute like total ranking black mirror bullshit. I cannot get behind. So like, yes, five star reviews, reviews in general on Etsy are really important. Um, and that's like, that's not quite as easy to fake as, um, follower account on social media, which is quite easy to fake. Um, so yeah, it's, a. Uh, not to discredit myself, I too have an Etsy shop with lots of 5,000 or five five star reviews. Um, but it, it's still, yeah, let's not talk about Etsy. It's a thorn in my side. <laughs> any, any platform aside, if there's reviews, it doesn't matter what, how many five stars there are, go read the reviews. Even at just five minutes, go and read anybody's yeah. reviews because they may have five stars, but the ones that are negative might stand out like, whoa, like that person treated me like crap and this is this. It's one thing if it's like, oh, it wasn't what I expected or, oh, it was a little bit too small because you're it, buying through oh, the screen. Listing described it to me. That's the internet, you know? And I'm, I know, so, in my language. Okay. Um, do you feel selling in person is better than online or vice versa? That depends on what you're... So, uh, depends on your lifestyle. I mean, I used to sell in person only and I shifted to only selling online and I have a lot more free time for myself. I do miss out on a lot of things that show up at mineral shows. Like I have new colleagues that are, that are newer in the industry that do the shows and don't do online. And they're finding all the new collections and there are the old collections of the old timers who are showing up in person and be like, Hey, I got rock. You don't buy it, man. He's like the best rock you ever seen. You know what I mean? Like you, and, I'm okay with, by the way, it's very Appalachian. I, that's, I, I approve. <laughs> what are you talking? No, you can No, no, <laughs> not okay. Not appropriate. Not in my house. Culturally appropriate. Appalachian, fine, because we're in the backyard. Apples are good for you. <laughs> I'll get rusty. I will end this live right now. I'll turn this car around. Someone called me a badass mama a little earlier when I scolded you before, so... <laughs> I'll do it. Okay. <laughs> Somebody else said word of mouth is the best reference for all industries. I love hearing that echoing what Rusty had said earlier too, because I think it's true. Like, I don't know that I personally as a customer would ever actually, I take that back. You know what? I have totally done that. I was trying to buy a couch on Instagram. I found an account that I really loved and a couple people had posted. They were like tagged. They obviously had the couch. They were like, look, my dog loves it. And I mess it, I DM'd them and I was like, hey, do you still love your couch? And I, like the post is a couple years old. And they were like, yeah, it's fantastic. I did that for like three or four people and I ended up buying the couch. So yeah, actually that's, um, you could do that with, with respect, you know, like courtesy in the DMs. Don't just slide into people's DMs, but still. <laughs> um, or do like I did. Okay. Um, yes, thank you. Tigra says there are a lot of bad apples within reviews. The reviews are the bane of my existence sometimes. Um, oh man, don't oh. even get me started. <laughs> and found you through referral. Do you need a license to shop at gem shows? Yes and no. So a lot of the big gem shows are <clears throat> both wholesale and retail. Um, it depends on the vendor, depends on the show. Um, but if you are shopping wholesale, there's usually a minimum and you do need like a sales and use tax ID or an EIN um, to purchase. So yeah, that's a pretty easy one. Other questions? We've got a few more minutes if you have them. <clears throat> if you don't fill the feed with questions, Rusty's going to start drumming and then we're in trouble. 
<laughs> Man, you're never hear my drum. I know you will. I think I, <clears throat> okay. I, my first question for you was, are you qualified? Why are you qualified? Um, I've asked all my questions and I think we have covered a lot of ground. Yes. Do you have I any agree. closing, do you have any closing remarks? Can a Canadian come to Tucson? Yeah. I mean, as long as Canada says it's okay. Man, all the comments stopped for me. They don't, they don't exist any anymore. Any Moldavite vendors you can recommend? You're looking at them. <laughs> Moldavite. Woo! Do a little like Brady Bunch, like me and him. Yeah. Um, let's talk about price gouging. Well, we could talk about pricing briefly. Um, I, I got a, I got a, <laughs> Citrine prices from Brazil went up about 25, 30%. Like this week, I was about to buy a lot in, in Brazil. I know, I know. I could not believe, like I got the message and I was just like, holy shit. Oh my God, I can't believe that's what Citrine costs. And I was like, yes, please show me pictures. <laughs> because I mean, we're kind of, we're kind of uh, addicted to this, aren't we? But uh, yes, we'll save the live. Um, how often do we do this? We've never done this before. <laughs> oh. First time. Um, everybody's showing Rusty some love. Hello, check out my Etsy shop. What about her, dude? Yeah, what about you? I can't even see any of these comments. The last comment I see is, you remind me of my brother, Rusty. And that I was, was like, cute. Someone... Oh, they're all gone. They're all, they're all the comments are gone. Anyways, I want to talk about price gouging for a second because Sorry. this is really, this is actually not even gouging, but pricing in general. So I have literally started at retail and then went to wholesale and then went to manufacturing. And I, I understand what it happened from the hole in the ground all the way to retail. Like I understand every single step because I've done, I've literally inserted my business at every single step. Like I used to be a wholesaler and then I was doing a little bit of both. And then I started manufacturing. And so here's a generalization and it's not across the board, but like, just think about this for a second somebody digs a rock out of a ground or they dig 10 tons of this rock out of the ground. All right. They get $1. I'm just going to make up numbers. Say that. So don't think that this is your unethical numbers. It's not about the numbers. It's about the percentages and how this stuff grows. And you know, people might be turned off by this idea, but this is legitimately how it is. And so this is, this has to do with price gouging it, or the concept of gouging at the very end. So if I dig 10,000 kilos of malachite, and then it cost me a dollar a kilo to dig it or whatever. Or I just dug it and it cost me nothing. And I sell it to a middleman for a dollar a kilo. So the middleman has a dollar a kilo in it. The middleman has to make money. So say they're going to double their money on it. Well, the middleman sells it to the manufacturing company for $2 a kilo. The manufacturing company then cuts it. All right. So if the manufacturing company cuts it, all rocks are different, but if you're making tumbled stones, you probably lose 40%. If you're making round beads, you're gonna lose 90%. So let's just make up an arbitrary number. Like you lose 50% of the rough. So now automatically the price that you have in it, if you're losing 50% of it and it costs you $2 a kilo, then what you have remaining is $4 a kilo, okay? Now that doesn't include the labor. So just the material itself, what's finished costs you $4 a kilo, then you got the labor to do it. You got all the polishing wheels. You got all the grit, all that stuff, whatever. Let's just call that another dollar. These are made up numbers. They could cost a lot more than that. But they, the manufacturing company now has $5 a kilo in the finished product. They have to double their money or more. But let's just stay with the doubles, right? So they have to sell it to a wholesaler, a large wholesaler, like some of the biggest companies out there. Like there's whole, like I, I could consider myself a wholesaler, but I'm not a big wholesaler. Like I'm not buying containers of one item. You know what I mean? Like there's companies out there that are literally selling $10 million a month and they're making like 20% profit. And that's, that's a big wholesaler. So if the, if the manufacturing company sells it to a big wholesaler for $10 a kilo, they're doubling their money. The big wholesaler then sells it for $20 a kilo and they're doubling their money. Now the big wholesaler could be selling to retailers like you and me would be considered retailers. There's also a step in between. So like if they're buying it for 20 or buying it for 10 and then say they wanna sell it to a smaller wholesaler, well, they wholesale it for 15, right? So the price goes easily from $1 out of the ground and now we're at, let's just skip that middle part and say you and I pay $20 a kilo. From the, whole, the big wholesaler sells it to a retailer for $20 a kilo. The retailer then has to at least double their money on it. And so they're making it and it's $40 a kilo. So we very clearly can see how something that comes out of the ground starts at $1. It gets through a manufacturing process and it goes through at least one wholesaler's hands to get to a retailer. And it's $40. 
Yeah. At the end. But this isn't price gouging. That is, this is basic economics. It's, yeah. it's, this is just how it works. And most right. people, so like when it comes to the idea of price gouging, like, you know, right. if I was to just ram arbitrarily tell you that costs a dollar a kilo to get it out of the ground, but that person's selling it for 40, that sounds like price gouging, but actually that's only every single person only doubling their money, which, you know, is really not a huge margin in order to make a living in this industry. Right. And it's also necessary that everybody along the way gets paid for their time, work and invest in something. I mean, I've, I don't get it very often because I speak really openly on the subject of what things cost, what materials cost. You know, I'm not giving out kilo and gram prices necessarily, but I speak openly otherwise that, you know, I, this is not a, there, there are people who believe this is a uh, spiritual service because we're working with a, with something that has metaphysical properties. I'm watching my cat climb over my inventory right now as we speak. And I'm trying not to like freak out a little bit inside. Um, Put it in the drawer. Put it in the drawer and push the drawer. <laughs> <laughs> I sold her some drawers. And so I know she has these awesome drawers in there. She just put They're it in the drawer. It'll be fine. Drawers are full. I need more drawers. Jeez. <laughs> Get rid of all the. Come on. You need to sell more rocks. This, oh. What was I talking about? I'm just trying to like keep him. He's going to start drooling on me in a second. Um, no, but this is the process of of buying and selling that, be, you know, some people believe that because we have, you know, we're working with something that is, it's not essential. It's largely for spiritual or self-fulfillment or self-developmental purposes that we somehow should be um, doing this out of the goodness of our hearts. That this is a voluntary thing. I think you and I, Rusty, do a lot out of the goodness of our hearts. We also need to feed our children at the end of the day. Um, and it's not just us. It's, this is, this is the core of ethical, functioning on the planet. Um, this is the core of integrity um, and making sure that everybody's taken care of. I personally, like one of the questions I ask when I work with a new vendor is how are your, how are your workers paid? How are your miners or your carvers um, paid? Are they paid fair wages based on your country's economy? Um, knowing that I have blind spots, I don't know, you know, the, the exchange rate for the USD to every currency on the planet. Um, I go on a little intuition, but I also ask common sense questions as well. Um, somebody had also asked about um, supplies. I mean, we can talk about renewable and non-renewable resources, the bubble wrap and packing paper and boxes that we use to pack and ship everything. I mean, yeah, I, I think that that might be getting a little off topic. So we'll save that for another day. Um, can but, I call somebody out? No, not directly. I mean, you ask a question, you call yourself out. Like, that's not <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm, all right, all right. So, in terms of price gouging, I won't name names, but there are companies out there who literally are like. Oh, you're not naming names, Rusty. That's not. You keep it classy around here. Yeah, well, that you. They, I mean, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out who I'm talking about. I don't even need to mention names, but there are companies that exist out there that go and find a rock that isn't necessarily something new, and they give it a fancy name, and then they put a zero at the end of the price. Now. That would be considered potentially unethical price gouging. And like there's one particular company who I call a necessary evil who's really popular in a lot of the marketing of stones. And they've done a lot of really good work. And then you look at some of the way that they price things and, it's, and, and I've supplied them before and I've actually given them stuff that they've named and turned into this thing. And sometimes, you know, there's a, there's a line where it's just like, wow, you know, you really need to buy that for $10 a kilo and sell it for $10 a gram. I mean, that's like a hundred times markup. Like there's limits where it's like, okay, there's some price gouging and that does happen in this industry. And I learned that really quick. Yeah. And I think that's what people were talking about. I'm glad you gave us like the rundown of, of, you know, start to finish, you know, earth to alter, as I say, but people are saying, some of the bigger crystal shops, price gouging is com is a concern among IG sellers. Many of them, Many of them have proven they are skyrocketing tax. Uh, I, I actually don't understand the question, but I'm getting the gist of it. Um, you know, that there's price gouging on the retail end of things. So, I mean, or when people call things Herkimer diamonds that are just quartz. I mean, Herkimer diamonds are quartz. They're not diamonds, but, you know, that's where, like, you just got to know, like, locale and, and quality. Um, I mean, what you're looking for in your retailer is somebody who knows the industry, has good connections, a good reputation, also has a good eye. Um, I didn't, I didn't, you know, I didn't grow up, um, you know, I grew up loving rocks and minerals, but I didn't grow up like grading minerals. Um, I think I just have good taste and I say that without ego. I just do. 
And over time, it's really easy for me to see, I gravitate towards things that are high quality and I have the good taste. I like what I like, but then I, over time have come to learn that that tends to be higher grade. So, I mean, there's price gouging and then there's grading and quality of crystals too. And, and for those who are not in the industry, it, I think it can be really, it can be really um, easy to misconstrue higher quality minerals and more expensive minerals with price gouging because people don't know what they're looking at. So I say that humbly, like sometimes I don't know what I'm looking at. I've, I've learned a lot as I've gone again with a basis of just like a good eye. But I think, yes, I think it's both and. I think there are there is price gouging happening in every industry as it, as it does everywhere. But I also think sometimes buyers might see something that to them is deemed overpriced or exp too expensive. It's out of their range or you know, compared to something else that they might have seen. But if you don't have a nuanced eye to say, how is this chunk of black tourmaline different than this chunk of black tourmaline? I mean, there's a huge range in black tourmaline alone. You could spend $3 on black tourmaline or $300 on black tourmaline. Um, we do have to be a little bit discerning and just, again, understanding where our blind spots are, but also as a buyer, understanding where your blind spots are. Um, our, or Herkimer's that aren't from New York. Yes, Herkimer diamonds only come from Herkimer County, New York. Um, I'm not sure if I saw your question. I'll scroll back up and let Rusty talk while I look. Good interjection point about yep. the, about grading. This is really cool because now, you know, I, Hey, I spent a little bit of time calling out China earlier in the talk right now. I'm going to give China like the ultimate props because they are the single best graders in the entire industry. And it's really mm. interesting. And it's a good, it's a good perspective to share because the way that it works in China is that they're huge buyers and they'll buy containers and they bring all these containers in. And they'll process all of it. And then they have very, very strict grading systems. And until you've been in front of some of these sellers in their markets where it's like, there's the best and there's the second best and there's the third best and there's the fourth best and somewhere in between two and three, you can't tell the difference. And somewhere in between three and four, you can't tell the difference because you don't know how they grade until you really start looking. It's like at the very end, it's like, okay, that's got black spots. And then that one's got yellow spots. And this one's a little bit better color. And that one's a lot better color their grading system absolutely blows my mind. And what's really interesting about dealing with China is that their grading system creates opportunity because they, they, they make, they put an exponential gouging price on the absolute top best material. And it all sells within their own country for the most part. We don't understand it. We don't see it. You can access it if you know where to look, but, you, but you would be shocked at the prices. Yeah. I mean, I've seen Sujalite bracelets for a hundred thousand dollars and I know that they're worth that. Yeah. Because it's the craziest shit you've ever seen and you don't know what that means. But so what's cool is that because they're making this crazy Uber price, this, ga this super gouged price at the very top, that means that everything at the very bottom, they just sell for cost or less. A lot of times I've bought stuff in China for less than the cost of cutting because it's the part that they don't care about. And it's still great for our market. We love it. We don't care that the pyrite has a little bit of brown specks in it. They just want the pure stuff and blah, 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 you know? So it's like, it creates a really interesting opportunity to understand where these systems lie. And the Chinese are absolutely the best at grading. And I have so much humility and respect for their ability to grade because, and that's why I like to do a lot of business with them because the, a lot of times the stuff that I want to buy in country of origin, I can buy it cheaper in China than I can in country of origin mm -hmm. because they've graded it and they took out the absolute best and made their crazy margin on it. And the, then they are really fair on this part. Whereas, in the country of origin, they may just want an average price, which is higher than what the price is in China for some of the stuff. So it just makes it for a really interesting market. And, you know, they are really strong. And, you know, I, I, I know people have a lot of uh, reservations with dealing with them because you have to learn and understand how they work. But, you know, so that just has a lot to do with what you're talking about in terms of grading. We don't even even I like there's plenty of things that I haven't seen. And and Westerners just don't understand what the best quality is. You know, we can call something triple A grade, but it's the triple A grade of what we've seen. Right. Absolutely. And that's, that's subjective. And until you like the old timers know, like some of the stuff that even I haven't seen, that's like 40 years old. You know, Oh, back in the day, man, this shit was so good. You know, it's like what we see now is nothing because it just doesn't come like that anymore. And yeah. gem silica is a primary example. The stuff that came in the 1950s is by far and above the best shit that ever came out of the ground in any hole, in any country and anywhere. And nobody even knows it exists because there was only like 50 pounds of the best of the best of the best. And so to have seen it is like, whoa, okay. Pat, thanks, Rusty. <laughs> okay, somebody's asking, would you buy anything from Home Goods? Any crystals from Home Goods? No, 
No, I would not recommend buying any uh, minerals from a big box store ever. Never, definitely not. Some people responded and they're like, no. I mean, just for the sheer fact that there's no accountability or traceability, but also like why support the Amazon of crystals when you could come to Christina or Rusty and support a small family business? I'm not going to do this and not promote both of us. So there you go. <laughs> Buy from her. She's best. Oh, sweet. You're just <laughs> wait. Kiss my <laughs> Okay. <laughs> uh, I, I will say this about home goods really yes, quickly I, and, and Walmart and these places don't buy from them, but it's very interesting that they're selling these things. And it's a very clear indication that what we're selling is, is trending. And that's a good thing because there's more people that are coming to crystals. And a lot of that is direct relationship to consciousness. It's a direct relationship to our evolution. And it's, you know, I, I would never buy from those. I don't, I don't suggest that people do, but it's just amazing that they actually offer it because it just shows that, they're even into it too. And this is a really interesting point. And I make this point a lot. I used to sell on Amazon and I don't anymore because they totally hacked my account from inside. And that's a long story. I won't go into it, but Definitely don't. we don't want to hear it. <laughs> <clears throat> no, it's a terrible, <laughs> terrible story. But Jesus. what I tell people about awful. our, what I tell people about our industry that's really interesting. And what, so my value add, what my company does and the reason why we can succeed and anybody can succeed in this industry in some reason, and that Amazon cannot take it over is because it cannot have consistency. It doesn't come out of the ground the same every single time and you win it and it's a lot of it's cut by hand. And so my value add is actually getting in a big parcel, sorting out the quality, sorting out the sizes and creating my own category so that you, the buyer, can understand how it fits into my structure. If it was literally cookie cutter, it was this way every single time and it came out this size, Amazon would totally steal this industry and corporations yeah. would run the show and we would not have the ability to do this. And so that's a really key point that the, the fact that everything comes out of the ground different, it gives the sovereignty, it gives, it opens up sovereignty for small businesses and for people like us because we do the value add and we put in the work to make it. So here, this is what you're getting in my structure. Yes, totally. And that's a, that was a beautiful way of putting something to words that I had intuitively felt that I hadn't actually like, um, structured as part of what I bring to the table. So I will, have that in my back pocket the next someone's next time someone's like why don't you just do this out of the goodness of your heart for free <laughs> um someone's saying but it's not fair when the high grade crystal for example the 300 hundred dollar tourmaline is sold for 600 by another ig seller the lack of regulation is a big concern honestly that kind of sounds like you've been fucked over <laughs> and it sucks we've all been there like we've we've been there um i think it requires some discernment and research and time and again like rusty said before we make mistakes even as as retailers but also as buyers um it it but to speak to what rusty has just said about our value added our eye our discernment there's a reason that people pick certain shops and they really stick with them they like the vibe yes and the energy sure but they also like the curation the eye that someone brings to their collection and it has to be to some degree, it has to be at the discretion of the seller to, to determine what they're going to charge. Now, I'm not advocating for price gouging. I'm advocating for covering your needs. I actually have priced things way under than I should have. There's a lot of really, really incredible material that I put out in the world and barely made even on because I wanted it, because I loved it, because a, a valued customer wanted it, um, and I sourced it for them. You know, there's just, and that often gets untold or um, unseen. Um, I'm not going around saying that often, but it also has to mean that you get to choose. If you do, like Rusty said, get an entire parcel and you're grading it out. If you see some, even though you might have paid by kilo for that parcel, if you see some that are particularly exceptional specimens, you make the call on what that's worth. Um, and trusting again, that it all evens out at, on, at the end. Why are we still talking about home goods though? I don't understand. I keep seeing it like pop up. You put your finger up like you wanted to say something. So I'm, I'm asking to talk. Can Go we, um, can, so I want to talk about that tourmaline. Um, the one that, you know, somebody buys for 300 and then immediately puts it up for 600. So this is a really interesting thing. Uh, was it's a, it's a tourmaline worth 300 that the IG seller just sells for 600. Right, That's well, worth, the value. worth is speculative value. So okay. everything is in the eye of the beholder. When it, it, something is worth what somebody will pay for it. If a vendor wants to, like, I, I'm not gonna call somebody out, but I sold a rock for $1,000 a couple weeks ago and I saw it online for $4,000 a couple days ago. And, I, and you know what? 
it, do, it doesn't bother me because if they can get it, more power to them. I'm not going to say that's right. I'm not going to say that's wrong. It actually happens to be something that's so rare where there was only 150 of them ever found. And I know that. And I passed along that information. One day, it might be worth that. Somebody might actually come on there and be like, wow, that's from that pocket. That's totally worth that. So if somebody buys something for 300 and they put it up for 600 right away, that's their prerogative. It's your prerogative as a buyer to, to buy. know if that's a good deal or not. Yeah. Because sometimes somebody might not have market information and they may buy something for 300 and sell and, and then somebody will take it and put 600 on it. But like they just found out that that mine closed and they know that in two weeks or in two months or in two years, that stuff's going to be worth $2,000. And so it's really, you know, I, I, I was in the high end of the mineral industry for a while. And I literally like was in the room with the big wigs and like, I did not like it. I did not want to keep up with the Joneses. I did not want to play the face and schmooze and do all the bullshit, but I stood next to the- So much the, bureaucracy in the high end mineral, real? Oh my God. But so what, yeah, oh, it's crazy. It, uh, somebody could, somebody could- I'm kidding. Uh, I'm curious. It's not my realm. Like it's, I, it's- I didn't know that you had dabbled, Rusty. I didn't know. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've sold in Tucson right next to Rob Levinsky and the Arkenstone and Collector's Edge. And I mean, I've been in the room with all those big guys and I've sold. I mean, I sold them an, an emerald specimen to the Smithsonian in 2017 at the main show in Tucson. And they it's on display at the National Collection. You can go and see it. I mean, we and whatever. I'm not too tooting. This is just like I've been in the room with these guys and like I know that speculative value is speculative value. And like, I've literally sold something to a high-end mineral dealer before and I sold it for 2000 and he went and put it in his room for like 40,000. And I didn't feel great about it, but you know, I mean, I don't think he sold it, but at the same time, it's like, if he's got that buyer that's gonna come and pay that, then more power to him. And uh, I'm not saying that that's necessarily right or necessarily wrong, but like when that kind of stuff happens, it's easy for us to judge and be like, oh, that's wrong to do that. But if the, if there's there's a whole different set of clientele where like the super uber rich people want to buy from these rich dealers and they want to pay these crazy prices, be part of its prestige, part of its ego, part of it is that they're actually are getting something that's that rare and that can't be replaced. And part of it is like, oh, I found out that there was something wrong with this piece and I want to return this $50,000 specimen. I'm going to take it back to the dealer and he's got $10 million worth of stuff and I can trade it or if I want my 50 grand back he can pay me like if i sold a fifty thousand dollar rock and there and it was repaired and i didn't know about it and i already spent the money and the buyer and the buyer came to me and they're like you need to refund this for me i'd be in a deep shit you know because that's like oh what am i gonna do and of course i would bend over backwards to either figure out who gave you know who got it to me and didn't tell me and try to like remedy it but like in the end i would take responsibility for it but that's why these high-end dealers exist and why these people want don't have a problem paying some with an extra zero on it because they know that there's accountability of the dealer if there's a problem. So I, I learned a lot of that and I don't like the fact that I would have to keep up with the Joneses and whatnot, but there is a whole other level when you're at the, the Uber echelon top where some of these prices are justified and because they are, mother nature does not produce a lot of perfect stuff. And there's just, there's a quality out there that you can see it online. But when you understand like the, the deals that happen behind closed doors that never get seen and some of the stuff that goes in these billionaires hands, I mean, it's unbelievable shit. And I, there's some stuff that I thought should have been $20 million specimens and they sold for 600,000. And I was like, damn, that's it. Like that huge aquamarine that came out last year from Pakistan that everybody saw. I don't have exact information, but I don't think that sold for multi millions of dollars. Hmm. And that should be multi millions of dollars because it's so crazy and big and rare. I have another question. How okay. do you know prices when so many different websites have different prices? Just research. Uh, so I'm not sure how to even start answering that because there, there's a lot of layers to that. Hold on. Here's a good way to answer it while you're thinking about it. Being fucked in the crystal industry is a rite of passage. <laughs> <laughs> that's true that's a, true of any business right of passage is it not well okay. i mean it's i wouldn't call it a rite of passage but my biggest mistakes were the biggest mis my my biggest mistakes were my greatest lessons and the people who fucked me the, the hardest i learned a lot about how to protect my money and how to do my research and like yeah, yeah i would have taken those experiences back but like that's how you learn and yeah. that's you know nobody wants to get fucked over like that sucks when that happens just look for the silver linings there's silver linings in everything I'm kidding. <laughs> I didn't hear you because I was talking at the same time. I just said, I don't know. Scorpios do. <laughs> <laughs> Rusty's a Scorpio. I'm giving him shit. That's why. Say hi. Four. Four Scorpio. Oh, you have four planets in Scorpio? 
You have a stellium? I don't know. I have to look it up. It's one of those things. It's a bunch. Yeah, it's okay. Um, okay. Um, well, let's see. Okay, hold on. Honestly, nobody is qualified to grade gems without a mineralogy degree or GIA certification of some sorts. What do you think about that? Oh, I think that's bullshit. No, sorry. Did I say that? Um, Tell no, us all right. So I understand. All adults, actually, I don't know that we're all adults here, but we're going to... All right, all right, hold on. All right, for diamonds and for colored stones and for things that are crazy valuable that are like wedding rings and stuff, absolutely, you need to go to a gemologist, somebody that needs to look at it and be like, that's VVS, very, very slightly included. And it's got this hue followed by that hue and it's this thing and refractory index, like all of that science aspect of gemstones. Absolutely, you need to have somebody who knows what they're doing in order to technically, officially grade and even potentially evaluate some of that stuff. However, when it comes to mineral specimens and when it comes to polished stones, or, but mineral specimens is a good uh, category to, to choose. Like, I'm, I'm not going to toot toot my, home, my horn here necessarily, but I, yeah, having... Twice now, which makes me think you are tooting your horn. All right, I'm tooting my horn because you did this. You made me think about tooting your horn. Um, <laughs> people that have field knowledge that go to the mining areas and go to the markets in country of origin where the rocks come from have just as much, if not more knowledge than the people who have studied it who have not traveled. Traveling and being on the ground, even if you don't have the science, can be absolutely more valuable, even in identification. I have not taken one geology course. Actually, I took one geology course in college and I failed it because the guy was a dinosaur and it was planetary geology and I didn't even show up and it was terrible. That's really- And I didn't, I didn't like geology at all. I've never studied geology, no, however- Zero, yeah, yeah, yeah. However, I know from my experience and from my field knowledge that I can identify minerals better than a lot of people who have gone to school who have not had the field knowledge. Now that's a generalization. It's not to say that studying the science isn't important, but it's like anything. It's like science and spiritual science, you know, like you can study whatever, but the experiential aspect of going through the process is infinitesimal, is infinitely as valuable, if not more valuable, in some certain circumstances in this particular industry, especially for identification, yeah. grading, pricing. People that go to GIA don't know, that don't know how to price mineral specimens. You know, people that go to the crystal markets know how to price mineral specimens because they're buying and selling, and they see what people are buying them for. Well, yeah, it's book knowledge versus street knowledge. It's academ academia versus experience. Like, and that that's across the board for most of the human condition, and it applies to the mineral industry as well, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Stone Bitch says, I don't know that we're all adults. Ain't that the truth? Um, <laughs> adults? What do you mean? <laughs> that was like five minutes ago. Um, experience is invaluable. Um, what are your thoughts on having children help families with the rocks? This is a good question that we, you know, brings us back to the ethical piece of it. I mean, obviously having small children do manual labor is wrong. Like, like true child labor is wrong. Do I also employ my six and eight year old to do little tasks so their hands are busy and they just shut the fuck up for a second? Like, absolutely. And it gives them something to do. They feel invested. My kid, my older daughter who's eight thinks she's, I mean, she may well inherit the crystal lion. She calls herself the crystal cub. I didn't say that. She said that. It's the cutest thing ever. Um, I know what you mean though, but that, like we have to, we have to ride the line culturally. We have to ride the line um, ethically, yes, but with 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 humanness involved too. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with children being involved with a family business. Um, I do think it's wrong that children are doing hard labor when they should be in school, or you know, they're not their their needs or their basic needs are not met. So I think like um, while that's an important topic to discuss, I think it's a it's a pretty cut and dry ethical question. Um, I think as far as like the sourcing of minerals, the goal is always to source from adults who have consented to do the work and who are being compensated financially appropriately. Um, okay, so I'm catching up to, um, oh, Kirsten, I didn't know you had a geology based degree and all of the best professors were those with extensive field experience as well. Uh, to back up Rusty's point, but I didn't know that about you. She's a regular, like years long regular, and I'm still learning things about you guys. Um, uh, <laughs> so I'm still catching up. Definitely put your cats to work if you could. Mine is sleeping on the table at, as we speak. It's definitely working very hard. 
Um, what other questions? Let's talk about mineral toxicity and how many sellers have no idea what stones they're selling and are deadly to children, adults, and pets. Okay. And I'm caught up on that note. This might be one of our last questions. If you're, I mean, I'm not tired. I'm a fire sign. I'm up all night. It's fine. But um, we can talk about mineral toxicity because there are a lot of, there's, so yes, there are a lot of crystal sellers on Instagram who are new as of the massive trend that has started in the last few years, even just before COVID. But um, through the beginning of COVID in 2020, this industry really became incredibly trendy. A lot of people jumped on board. A lot of people decided to start their own crystal shops and base it out of their homes because it was easy to do during a panini. But it is also, um, it's also really important to know that Rusty and I have experience on our side. I've been doing this since way before the panini, but now I am, I'm just not saying I'm trying not to say COVID, but I did anyway. Instagram, I wanted to write something. It flagged me. It's weird. It's We're so censored, but um, that's a story for another day. So, hey, but the, you need a panini, eh? Ah, but the, stop. <laughs> so there are, there are a lot of green sellers, and I'm not saying that they won't eventually, you know, fill out and grow into their own and learn through the mistakes that we have we have been through as well. Um, but there are a lot of people who just don't know about the minerals that they're selling. If as a buyer, you hear from a, you know, I was in a live, this was a long time ago. It was like a year or two ago. Um, and somebody called dog tooth calcite, uh, stellar beam calcite. And I was like, <gasps> they didn't know, but they were selling it and they were asking for money for it with false, like with bad information. It's, Mistakes happen, yes, but also like if you're being a discerning a discerning buyer and you want to be really mindful about who you're purchasing purchasing from and feel that you can trust that seller, then pay attention, ask questions, then pay attention to the answers. Um, uh, what is Sheen? I don't know what Sheen is, you guys. People are saying cough, cough, Sheen. Sheen's straight up steals from artists. Rusty, do you know what Sheen is? S-H-E-I-N, Shine. She ain't trying. Who is that? Is that a person? Logos and everything. Is this like a drop shipping kind of situation? Never heard of uh, it. I'm not blushing after Rusty says something. It's hot <laughs> now. Worked up. All my blushing comes from within. I have a burning fire within and I get really worked up. If you notice, I start getting red in the face when I'm worked up. It's not Rusty. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't okay. put crystal that's water. I mean... There are some water safe crystals, but that's not that's not what this live is for. Um, also, so, okay, so people are talking about malachite and bumblebee jasper. There's also something um, to be said for understanding that some minerals have inherent properties that are toxic to human beings, but also understanding that those properties are only released when those minerals are undergoing a certain process. So malachite being dangerous when it's being uh, cut and polished and processed, but if you hold it, probably fine. Would I put it in a water to drink an elixir? No. But I mean, like, there has to be a little bit of common sense and wiggle room there. Um, and again, a basic understanding of geology, if you really want to go a little deeper, you know, that's, that's on you to do it. Okay, Shine is an online shop. They steal fashion art. They stole from Sarah Shaquille Many. Oh, I do know them. Okay. <laughs> You're blushing. You know how I feel about stealing shit. <laughs> I know. So, that's a rant that I will get on another day. I do all the time anyway. Um, okay. What is so? What is no gloves, no mask, nothing? I'm just catching up. Okay. And I do flush when I'm around Moldavite. It's true. <laughs> okay. Um, face of disapproval. Do you have anything to add to that, Rusty? I think we're kind of coming to a good stopping point. Yeah, I definitely wanted to, there's, there's a couple of points to make. Uh, you, you covered a, the basic part, but I think that there's a, uh, the cutting process for a particular bumblebee jasper, malachite, anything with asbestos, there's a huge difference. Like I know you said you wouldn't put it in an elixir and drink it. Like I'm not encouraging anyone to do that, but I don't think that those things would be nearly as toxic as actually inhaling it into your lungs because right. of the, the particulates being so small. Like the Chinese, actually, they, you know, we think that they don't have lots of regulations, but there was a time where malachite, well, they wouldn't allow malachite to 
be they would actually really strictly uh watch the cutting of malachite because the fi the the stuff that gets in the air actually was really hurting people and so they were being extra cautious around that because the cutting process itself is the most important part again don't go do this in your elixir but i i would i would probably assume more that it's not nearly as, as toxic and dangerous in an elixir as them as when it's cut now that's for malachite bumblebee all the asbestos minerals like petersite tiger's eye all that stuff then you get into stuff like realgar and you get into orpiment and you get into cinnabar those yeah. types of things and uh and stibnite antimony those are the kinds of things that you absolutely if you put those in uh, an elixir and you drink it you are going to have a serious toxic reaction those are very dangerous and um there's there was an article and i don't remember exactly what it was but there was like the 10 most dangerous minerals out there and it went viral a couple of years ago and this is why everybody asks about these minerals not the only reason but they're all actually the, the reason to back up a step the reason why we we're even having this live started from one article from the guardian there was an article that came out about five years ago about the ethics of mining crystals and they interviewed the sage goddess who knows nothing about mining but she's great she knows a lot about metaphysics uh -uh. She no. no she doesn't know a lot about mining we don't worry I'm not sorry. I apologize. I'm not. I'm not trying to call out anyone, but they they definitely what? interviewed her and I, whatever they 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 interviewed a bunch of people who didn't really have any understanding of mining. Okay, we'll leave it at that. And then the article that was written was absolutely painted to completely throw shade on the entire industry. The vibe of the whole thing was to make people question what they were buying, and with the intention of messing up the industry. Like it, I I wrote the article writer and i was like why did you not interview people that like actually have experience with mining so that you could know what goes on on the ground because a lot of what they what the, the questions that were asked and the answers that were given and what was printed and published was horrible and they almost turned it around to make it look like the industry was super bad and you shouldn't buy crystals and they did that with the article about ethical mining crystals as well there was there was one that came out i i don't know if it was the guardian or if it was like buzzfeed but there was a similar one that did had had a similar impact for you know a few weeks there um permanent impact before that happened i never got it i never i was never asked that question once and mm -hmm. the instant that that article came out everybody wanted to know about the ethics of mining and i'm not saying that it's wrong because it's a great topic to talk about but the way that the article was written it completely yeah. just painted it like y'all are buying the crazy shit you shouldn't do it it's terrible you know it's just like it was so bad and i guess i was so upset because like they literally created so much customer service for us that was unnecessary and now we get to talk about it and we get to ed educate and explain some of the things on the ground so that's the silver lining but man it was such a hassle because everybody was like that's all they wanted to know was tell me about the ethics of this and the ethics of that and i with the number of crystal sellers we have now it, it's much more of a pertinent question but back when the article was written it's just like a flood of questions to people who are pretty well established in the industry and mm -hmm. you know and and with the intent of like the the tone carried over into the 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 buyers were their intent was it just felt like it and i could be wrong because not everybody's like this but the generalize it was like you're doing something unethical please tell me how it's not rather than hey what's going on with the ethics of your crystals it was almost like automatically assumed this negative intent because of the way that the article was written and i was just like i'm gonna pull up my hair this is crazy because the answers that were given really made it look bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, there's a final question too about trademarked minerals. And I did kind of want to touch on this back when we were talking about pricing, um, because I think it's, you know, it's, it's pretty cut and dry, but we can touch on it anyway, because people have asked. Trademarking a mineral will often make it come with a higher price tag. Um, and unless, the, unless you own the trademark or you identify the trademark, you're not allowed to use that name uh, to sell that mineral. So what are your thoughts on trademarked minerals? I highly, highly disapprove. Um, I can see the value in doing it for a marketing standpoint, because it can give something a name that people can recognize. And it can like legitimize and solidify it in some way. But every single person that I have ever seen trademark a mineral wants to keep it for themselves. And like, I won't name names, but I have given minerals. I have given minerals that have been put at given names and put into books and had an extra zero written on it. Mm -hmm. And I asked, Hey, can I have the certification for your, th those minerals because I provided them for you. And they were like, no, that goes against what I'm doing. Basically the trademark is for me. 
and it's mine and you can't have it because I'm going to add an extra zero and I'm going to make all this money and nobody else can have it. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, I, I, well, I can't speak for everyone, but every single trademark of any kind of name or of any kind of mineral, that has always seemed to be the intent that it was only for them. Nobody else can use it. I'm going to fight you to the death because it's my name. And even if you go five feet over there to the, a different hole and find something that is exactly the same as what I have, you can't call it that. And I have a huge problem with this. And a lot of people will go as far as to be like, well, you got it from over there and it has a different energy than the one I got over here. And it's literally like 10 feet over there. And it's like, huh, what does not compute. So I'm really against it. I understand why it exists. I do love the fact that there are names that have been like really concreted, like Super 7. That's the first trademark mineral that it was. We, it's a little bit vague now because we don't know what exactly is Super 7. Because to me now, Super 7 just means red needles. That's all it means because it's, it's morphed. When it was originally made, it was literally amethyst, smoky, citrine, rutile, hematite, and the, whatever the other two minerals are. And like to actually get one with all seven inside was like hen's teeth. Like you could, it's so rare, even from the original finds to get all seven in one, but then they all were super seven. And then the, they didn't find that anymore. And so now it became super three, but we're calling it super seven. And now it's literally anything with red needles is super seven. And I don't necessarily agree with it, but so that's another topic that mineral names change a lot. And if you don't have like the historical way that things go down over generations, like right now, Kundalini quartz, everybody knows what Kundalini quartz is the citrine from the Congo. Well, what people don't know is that there is a man in Chicago and in the early 2000s, he named something Kundalini quartz and it stuck back then. And it was this specular hematite in quartz from Zambia, which was different from the completely different from the citrine. Yeah, I've never called the Congolese citrine Kundalini quartz. It's always been Luena citrine, always. Right. Well, I don't know when it started, but somebody re somebody named it Kundalini quartz, and now that's Kundalini quartz. And what I know is Kundalini quartz yeah. is this other stuff from Zambia that doesn't they haven't found it in years, and it's uh, it doesn't even exist. And so like that name got dropped because there was no stock, and it transferred to another name. That's a little different than trademarking. But it's kind of the same concept like so having names for things is really important and it's good because it helps the customer recognize what yeah. something is you know yeah. but to be it's, like it's not or like 23 there was some conversation happening there and somebody said it is it's not super seven is not the same as or like 23 even under their trademark names they're different um yeah so just interjecting there because it continues to go and i think if we just say it we can move on yeah uh, is this a lot of tea? I feel like this, I mean, inevitably this was gonna get a little awkward and controversial. So I, I'm just sitting in the discomfort, which I've learned to do. Um, but yeah, I mean, as far as my feelings about trademark, it's beautiful, are you kidding me? I don't wear makeup. So when I blush, it's actually my face. Um, thank you, thank you. <laughs> my feeling about trademark minerals is that it's, it's yeah, I mean, it's it you're commanding a higher price tag for the same thing. like. Indigo Gabbro being Mystic Merlinite. Um, so I don't use trademark names. I just rather call it what it is. But yes, naming naming is important. Understanding what it is is important. Um, key update up to 23 minerals. Um, you know what I like to do with, with trademark names? Yeah, what? I, I like to use them and not add the extra price to it. <laughs> so that it's like, hey, this is what it should well, be worth. And find it that way, yeah. Yeah, I don't I really disapprove of the trademark names, but it's it's subjective. You know, it's it's one of these like necessary. I won't use the word evil. It's like it's good for helping people. But the extra price is it's questionable, especially ethically in my in my book, specifically about that one person who I can't name, who really literally adds a zero. And I think one of those minerals that he can't get anymore or she I'm not going to say who it is. I think I literally say I call it Lowzite because I think they go to Lowe's in the garden section and they buy it and they put like $10 a gram on it. And then it's seriously like questionable. When one day I think it was one of the first times we interacted, you tried to offer me some healerite and I was like, you mean serpentine? And you were like, oh, I can't tell you how many times I've been to a booth and like the pure sexism. And then I pick out all their best specimens and the guy's like, oh, oh okay, you have good taste. <laughs> like, it's, and I also know, actually, I wonder if we can talk about gender really quick. Okay, I know this is like hour two, but I'm really, I think this is really interesting because this industry up until about the last decade or so 
has really been dominated by the privileged white male. Like, let's talk about that. What the old tiny rock hound dude looks like. Not unlike Ru Rusty here, but like, I mean, he's not old tiny. All right. <laughs> I'm going to stick. I'm going to stand by what I said. I stand by what I said. But there's, there's a lot of privilege in it inherently. Um, and it's largely been dominated by white older men. Um, and since a lot of crystal shops now are owned by younger women, millennial women, um, I think that is something really interesting. I'm curious what it was like when you began in the industry. Um, how long have you been doing this? Like 20 years? 20 years. When I joined the industry, I was told that this is the, that everything is on its way down and the heyday was over and that. And then the queen came along well in terms of like the pricing and the way that it used to be and the ability for somebody to step in and like really just make a really good living like and make it easy like it's gotten so much harder but the, the the generations before me just had it easy because it was a smaller industry and there was a lot more opportunity for this for the small number of dealers um so it's in terms of what you're back to what you're saying like absolutely like the the old timers are all old white men and like having gone into the high-end mineral industry i can tell you i've been invited and have had dinner with some of these like super high i went to a, a ball with like a dinner in tucson from one of the high, biggest collectors and like i literally remember standing in line for food and like having these old men look at me like what are you doing here you don't belong here you don't have enough money to be here and i just felt it and i was like oh! rusty <laughs> i i didn't i don't keep up with the joneses i was sitting at the table with billionaires and they were asking me questions and i was trying to keep a straight face and not like give some spiritual answer that was going to completely like rock their boat and stuff and it was just like oh what did i get myself into <laughs> Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's amazing that there is a shift and that there are people of uh, all kinds of different ethnicities at opening store and women that are totally like leading the way. I mean, Instagram is an amazing place. Like I, I kind of make fun of Instagram in general because there's this whole phenomenon on the internet of like, it's all about me. And like, there's a, a, again, the bad apples on Instagram, not even in our industry. It's just like, oh man, it's all about ego. And it's like all about like the superficial stuff which exists, but like there's this beauty in the fact that like a lot of these amazingly powerful women have kind of been like, look, we're going to do this in an artistic way. I mean, the, the way uh, like I could list a ton of different uh, Instagram accounts like Spirit Nectar and your account and like there's like the, the Fox Minerals lady. There's so many people you go on there and you look at their feet. And it's like, dude, this is crazy art. Like to scroll down this feed and be like, how much time was spent on each one of these videos or, or, or pictures and then to, to choreograph it in a way. <laughs> I mean, that's just awesome. And like, I'm gonna say, say it straight up, like men don't do that shit. We just don't. You know, our men have straight, had straight white men don't necessarily do that shit. Because men have had it squeezed out of them. It's not that, it's not that cis heteronormative men are not inherently creative. It's that they've been told to repress their emotions and not feel things and not be creative. And they're rewarded for being you know, tough and getting to the top and not for being artistic. So, you know, it's not your fault, Rusty. <laughs> it's not men's fault, but it is, um, you know, the creative aspect of it, the visual, the aesthetic aspect of it is definitely um, supported, uh, supported by the feminine. So. And, I, and it's amazing. Like it really is. An, and it really shines on Instagram a lot. Like the number of accounts that's just like, wow, look at the art just in what the presentation is, is mind boggling. You know, even if the stones yeah. aren't the craziest like mineral specimens, it's just about color. And that's what this industry is really all about. It's just about color. Yeah. I love, I love Abby's stuff, you know, the artist, she's an artist more than a, she doesn't sell rocks. She sells the art that she makes of rocks. She's just the, an artist in Canada and she, everybody knows her. She's great. And I lo just literally love to watch her put together videos where she's like putting these like rocks together. And, and you do some of these videos awesome where like the backwards videos and stuff like all that is so, artistically uh, inspiring and like I don't really have I mean I, I'm not a visual artist I I'm just, I know what looks right and I know what sells and I know what's good and what's not good but there is an aspect of choreographing that that Instagram is really highlighted that is just it's perfect and I and love it Buffalo Firefly makes a great point saying and men don't have to make it look fancy to be trusted My, I mean it's true it's I mean, true. like I'm deny that i'm still making 70 cents to your dollar probably maybe not in this particular instance because i know what i'm worth but 
not to say that other people don't, but to say that I can make my own prices. And when you're your own boss, it's a little bit different. But I mean, I think the point is really, I think the point is really good. We inherently believe that something is, that is beautiful in psychology, there's a there's a theory called what is it's terribly named. I don't know which white dude came up with the name for this, but it is <laughs> uh, what is beautiful is good theory. That's literally what it's called. You could Google it. What is beautiful is good. And so if we see something really attractive, we assume and assign goodness to it. Um, and I think, I don't know. I think the the typical white man has been looked at as good, and so it's an easy sell. You don't have to get fancy. For people to trust you to buy it clearly look how <laughs> i look for this live i washed my hair i put on a cute shirt i did my makeup and rusty's just like i rolled out of bed i mean hey, hey. sexism right here hey take it easy take it <laughs> easy okay calm down if you... but am i wrong am uh, I... hey i didn't say you were wrong but take it easy <laughs> you put me on the spot okay oh this has been really fun i think this is a good note to end on um this was really this was really fun and we should do it again with maybe a less heated topic to just enjoy oh it wasn't heated for me i i honestly i i enjoyed it i uh no pressure you know like it, it was good to talk about some of those things i probably exposed myself a little bit more than i normally do and you know said some stuff that i should have said i mean i'm sorry for some of those off flipping comments you were like hey you don't do that shit you know but i mean i'm gonna call it out it's no hard feelings i don't love you any less i'm just i think actually a good friend calls you out when you cross a line and vice versa. And I think, you know, for me anyway, um, but I'm not, you know, it's all good. <laughs> I'm gonna have to do. Like I'm seeing a few, okay, people are saying, cause so once we end the live and save it, you don't get to see comments anymore. So I just wanna say like people have been enjoying all the tea. They're putting up their little tea mug emojis. The live has been enlightening. Um, Natalie said, be nice to Rusty. No, no. <laughs> Natalie, Natalie. I'm kind to Rusty, but I'm firm. There's a difference. Be kind, not nice. <laughs> um, just um, so you know, Christina, yeah. I, we did record this and we will probably, with your permission, put it on YouTube so that all of the comments can be viewed again. Oh, wonderful. Lovely. Just tag me. You know how that goes. Of course. Like and share. Hit the button. I don't know. I don't do YouTube. It's so weird. You have a YouTube? I didn't know this. We have everything, man. You gotta have it all. I mean, don't forget, I got a bunch of people. I gotta keep them busy. That's so funny. Okay. All right. This will be on YouTube, apparently. I will save it to my IGTV as well. And then, great. That means all the comments will be saved. That's fantastic, too. Okay. Thank you so much, Rusty, for taking the time to be here, to answer questions, to um, sit through the, the hazing and the fire that I threw at you. You were a great sport. And I really appreciate your honesty and your candor and your knowledge. Um, because I 100% believe and know that we are doing the absolute best we can um, with a an internal compass of integrity. And that's really what it's all about. So, um, oh, and your music. Is your music on YouTube too? Uh, there's a little bit, but nothing recent. I should probably put some more up there. Yeah. <laughs> all right, you but guys. Just come see my lives. There you Sorry. go. Shameless plug. <laughs> Thank you everybody for joining to everybody who came and who listened and commented. It was really lovely to have you here. Um, we're really grateful. Thank you. Christina, you've been awesome. Thank you for having me. I'm really grateful for you and I'm really inspired by you and I'm really uh, excited to see your growth and Thanks. be a participant in helping you to shine and flourish and you know do your thing and change the industry and it's just awesome to see i remember like when i first saw your stuff when you still only had like thirty thousand people which is not a lot you know compared to now and it was just like who is this lady what's she doing and, you know i asked you about some larry Mo one time i was like i don't know what she's doing or if she knows what's going on and then it was just like damn all of a sudden you had like eighty thousand people and i was like what's going on she's like taking over instagram and in a good way and i mean I, anyways i'm just trying to give you props i'm really excited and happy for your growth and uh, i don't remember that i'm gonna have to scroll back through our messages about the larimar <laughs> it was a long time ago Origin story i know but i'm gonna dig now it's scorpio season that's what we do we go back through awesome. i appreciate it i will text you later to decompress <laughs> <laughs> awesome well thank you for having me and if you want to ever do it again i'm always available and feel free to follow up in any way shape or form Sounds good. Thank you guys. Have a good night. We'll see you soon. Awesome. Bye. Ciao.